It's probably better just to be yeah. careful of what you say. And <laughs> <laughs> leave it on you. Yeah. If you don't talk to it, don't go. <laughs> Can you tap it here to make sure it's on? Yep. Is it on? Is it on? Yes. Hello? Yep. Can you put it towards your mouth? I can turn here if I can put it. Once we get situated, I can kind of say we want. Okay. Certificated Public Employee Appointment, um, Government Code Section 54957, Classified Public Employee Appointment, Employment, Government Code 54957, again, 2.3 Negotiations Update, 2.4 Public Employee Discipline Dismissal Release, 2.5 Claims for Damage, 2.6 Existing Pending Anticipated Litigation, 2.7 is final settlement agreement and release for one special education student. <laughs> Welcome! <laughs> Bienvenidos. <laughs> so welcome to our board meeting on May 22nd. And thank you so much that all of you are here with us today. Gracias a todos que ustedes pueden estar con nosotros hoy. Bienvenidos y welcome. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> Sledge of a legion. You don't get a view there, but do it. Can you do it? She has to do it. You want to do it? Now you want to do it? Okay. Okay, Evan doesn't want to do it. Okay, Danny. Bueno, tenemos un traductor que no está donde está usualmente. Yo creo, creo que ella está afuera, Virginia, ¿verdad? Virginia. <laughs> ahí está. Mira, está, ahí está ella. Entonces, si ustedes necesitan este, que ella sea su traductor, entonces hay que conseguir los, aparat los aparatos con ella. <laughs> okay. And um, if anyone wants to speak to an item on the agenda, if you could please fill out these yellow cards and give them to Eva, and she will give them to us. And the yellow cards are there? And the yellow cards are way outside. <laughs> They're outside. Si quieren este hablar con sobre algo en la agenda. Si se pudiera conseguir una tarjetita a María afuera y ustedes 
Van a tener dos minutos. You're going to have two minutes to speak. Okay. Okay. Well, now we're going to have super, Dr. Rodriguez's superintendent comments. Yeah, thank you. So we've had um, some exciting events over the last several weeks. First, I want to say happy Classified Employee Week. So it actually started on Sunday. Um, we couldn't do it um, without you. Um, we also held our second annual college signing day. Over 200 of our PDUSD students representing 58 different universities were invited to attend our signing day. It's the most, the most popular colleges our students plan to attend include California State Monterey Bay, Sacramento State, San Jose State, UC Davis, um, representing the most popular university um, in the University of California system. So, hemos tenido algunos eventos emocionantes en las últimas, en las últimas semanas. Quiero um, dar las gracias a todos los empleados clasificados porque esa semana es su semana especial. Um, no pudimos hacerlo sin ustedes. Um, también celebramos nuestro segundo evento anual del Día de Firmas Universitarias. Más de 200 estudiantes de nuestro distrito que representa a 58 universidades diferentes fueron invitados a asistir a nuestro día de firma. Las universidades más populares um, en las que nuestros estudiantes van a planear asistir incluyen los que ya leí antes. Um, and we have, um, we have our graduation before our next board meeting. I want to recognize all of our students' hard work and wish them the best as they move forward towards post-secondary um, experiences, career, or military. We are proud of you. We hope that you come back and give back to your community. Please remember, due to construction at Cabrillo College, our graduation ceremonies for Pajaro Valley High School and Aptos High School will be at the fairgrounds this year. So, tendremos nuestras graduaciones graduaciones antes de la próxima reunión de la mesa directiva. So quiero reconocer el trabajo de todos nuestros estudiantes y dese desearles lo mejor a medida que avanzan hacia experiencias postsecundarias, um, profesionales o militares. Estamos orgullosos de ustedes. Esperamos que regresen a construir a nuestra comunidad. Recuerden que debido a la construcción en el Colegio de Cabrillo, nuestras ceremonias de graduación para las secundarias de Pajaro Valley y Aptas High serán en los terrenos de la feria este año. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> okay, we're going to try to do governing board comments. Um, do you want to start? So start with Georgia. comments that um, I wanted to say that I am um, very excited to hear about Cal State University, Monterey Bay, and Cabrillo College's MOU for the 2 by 2 program, um, which ensures students and those in our community who are seeking and looking to um, continue their higher education, the opportunity to get an associate's degree within two years and continue on to CSUMB and complete their bachelor's degree program within two years. Um, I know this was quite a struggle between the university and the college for some years to get to here, so I am very excited to hear about this. Um, also, um, just recently, at week, I attended with a few of my colleagues and the superintendent and um, some other cabinet members, my flag's 40th, um, Year. They're celebrating their 40th year and they had their annual brunch at Quiddy School. And we got to hear two great stories about students um, within our schools, within Pajaro Valley, from Dr. Rodriguez 
um, who are benefiting from this program out of the 2,500 students who are serviced through this program. Um, also, one last thing I just wanted to note was uh, my family and I attended the Pajaro Valley Shelter Services um, Mother's Day run. And um, it was really quite rewarding to hear the story of a, of a former student of our school district who was there. She and her mother spent two years in the shelter and then after that were transitioned for two years into um, another living unit. Um, it just reminds us to reflect that homelessness is not just a city or a county or a state issue. It affects us here as well at the school district. It's a community-wide issue and it has a real face. So it was great to be able to be there and be supportive of it and see so many community leaders that were there, not just sponsoring it, but actually doing the race and supporting the event. So thank you to all of them as well and to Pajaro Valley Shelter Services for their work in our community. Can you hear me? Sorry I'm late. I was at my daughter's open house at Watsonville Charter School of the Arts. So, <laughs> so um, this week, in the past two weeks, I've been a little bit more political than usual. Um, I have talked with fellow um, board member Danny Dodge. I've also talked with um, our lovely mayor, Francisco Paco Estrada, and we've been talking about um, trying to keep the needle program from coming into Watsonville and doing what we can to do that. Um, Chief Honda also sent out a letter in support of not having this program in. So we are doing our best to keep the needle giveaway without giving clean needles um, out of Watsonville, okay? Um, I've also heard from teachers and I know that we're working hard to sunshine the deal and that should hopefully be happening soon, okay? So I hear you, I've gotten your emails and I understand. I have also um, received inf some information and some emails about some issues that parents have had with SELPA and we will be addressing that and I have a meeting coming up with Dr. Rodriguez, so that rest assured that we hear your concerns and we are doing our best to help. Thank you. So it's definitely been an open house uh, for a lot of places. I attended the Rio de Mar Elementary Open House, and I really enjoyed seeing the classrooms and you know, watching all the, you know, the projects that all of our students are working and sharing with their families and community. Um, I also you know, attended the, the PVUSD College Signing Day, and I'd like to wish all of our graduating seniors um, the very best in the next chapter of their stories. Um, later that, that day, it's like I, I did a walkthrough through Aptos High, and you know, talking to the principal um, and then Vice Principal Slider, I appreciate hearing about the various programs and then the chance to speak with faculty and staff and students themselves. Lastly, I also attended the Life Lab celebration, and I'll just, in the interest of time, just echo with what George said. It's a, a pretty remarkable program. It's inspiring to see what students uh, and the community was getting out of this project. Good evening, everyone. Um, it was a pleasure serving in the Daylight Committee um, this past year. Yesterday was our last meeting, and we accomplished a great deal this past year uh, from addressing traffic and student safety concerns at PB High School uh, to developing a plan to ensure our families have access to and understand their student math scores to creating a one year of all the proven initiatives currently at our elementary and secondary schools, among other things. A huge thank you to our parent leaders for voicing their concerns and for their advocacy on behalf of our students. I also attended the PBUSD signing day, a very well attending and very exciting. Um, congratulations to our seniors as they embark on their new journey towards higher education. And lastly, I attended the Labor Management Initiative. I am excited about the possibilities of this initiative and future collaborations with both CSEA and PBF, um, PBFT leadership. Thank you. Hi, everybody.
everybody. <clears throat> Thanks for coming. I too attended the PBUSD signing day. My daughter is a graduating senior and she um, is going to the University of New Mexico next year, so I'm super excited and proud of her. She was the only uh, student in the whole um, place, I think, going to the University of New Mexico. There was not a pennant for her to hold up. <laughs> but um, she's super excited, and so am I. Um, I did attend the PBPSA, which is our, um, our standalone nonprofit that's dedicated for mental health service to our school district. I was at the board meeting there yesterday. And I also worked to um, encourage our county board of supervisors to pass a ban on flavored tobacco, which they did unanimously on Tuesday. And as of January 1st, there will be no more flavored tobacco for vaping, you know, like those jewels that's been outlined in the county, or banned in the county. We're hoping that um, Watsonville will follow. The city of Santa Cruz has already done it, the county board of supervisors, and next will become be Watsonville, so I'm hoping everybody will support that restriction on flavored tobacco so our kids don't um, hurt themselves by vaping. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. It's good to have a meeting here. I attended school here at E Hall a long time ago. Uh, just wanted to, to touch up. Uh, I also attended the Life Lab on Sunday. It was a good event. It ranged early in the morning, but by 12, um, it was. Sun was up, everything was drying out, and uh, it was a great event. I'm working on trying to see if Mini White could one day have a life lab and have a garden. I think that would pretty, be pretty nice for the community. Um, yesterday, I attended the Watsonville High Scholarship, where all the organizations around this area handed out scholarships. Um, I saw the Knights of Columbus, um, Carrasco Scholarship, just all those organizations. It was great to see alumni come out and donate money back to children in our community. And I also, I also talked about the needle program too. Um, I totally disagree with needles coming into the city of Watsonville. They wanted to set up shop at the Salvation Army on Union Street. I was totally opposed to that because all those needles are within one to two mile radius within these schools. Mini White, Eden Hall, Watsonville High, Radcliffe, um, the Youth Center. I thought it was a terrible idea to had up needles with any accountability and hoping we come back. So I'm glad that all of us wrote letters, the public wrote letters. Thank you, Mayor Chief Honda. Um, I'm glad that didn't come. Um, I also like to thank Ms. Susan Gallagher, who retired today. She was my teacher here a long time ago. And I'd like to say thank you, Ms. Gallagher, and good luck in your retirement. Thank you. Okay, so quickly, I'll try to be quick. So I all also went to the labor management initiative we had, and we decided for one thing that we're going to focus together on attendance. And we came up with all these great ideas of how we could work on it to do it together, all of us. It's great. Also went to the D-Life meeting with Maria. Um, I also went to the Hall District Open House. And I just want to tell you how excited I was to be there because um, they had a band. Woo. And so the flute section came up and played. And then the section with clarinets, trombones, trumpets. I think clarinets, trombones, trumpets. Yeah. They played. And then they had another quartet that played that had a kind of like, I think they had a bass tube. I think that's what it was. With them. So it was so cool to know that there's a band in elementary school. I should, I should have a clap for about that. Clap about that. <laughs> and I also went to the retirees celebration just before this. Um, and they gave out a um, celebration, I mean, a celebration to the, for the employees who have been here 40 years. And there was a couple of them that, that they didn't celebrate because they'd been here longer than 40 years, like 43 or 44, believe it or not. Um, and it was, that was so great. And um, Jennifer Holm was there too. She forgot to say that. <laughs> um, and it was so great to hear about, I mean, somebody got up and talked about each of these retirees. And it was so beautiful, wonderful to hear about all these incredible people that we're now losing. 
but how all the wonderful things they did while they were teachers or classified employees. That's right. So, so thanks. thanks. Okay, now we're going to do um, high school student representatives report. And I'm hearing there is just um, students from new school here, is that correct? So where can they go? Oh, well, here's the podium right there. New school, you can come up, you can come up to the podium. Hello, uh, my name is Christopher Lopez, and today I will be representing New School. Uh, so recently we went on a catamaran. Uh, we witnessed humpback whales and orca whales. Wow. And I was actually the one who took these pictures here. And uh, the man was our driver on the boat. Um, we also had a field trip to Meet Earth, which uh, introduced us about um, how humans impact the environment. Um, and they were explaining how we should start using more like degradable um, utensils, like plates, spoons, and straws, etc. Um, we were also talking about watersheds and how, and the picture on the bottom left is a demonstration on how our products such as like plastic and like waste go down um, the mountains and actually into our oceans and they were explaining how we could protect it is by using re uh, reusable uh, containers and after that we went to the beach and we decided to weed non-native plants which were the red guts um, we were able to I guess, I think it was a thousand, um, like, weeds that we pulled out. Wow, you've counted them out <laughs> great. Um, and we also had prom, which I believe was a success. Uh, the tickets were $10, um, which was affordable for every student to go. The food was enchiladas, enchiladas, and the transportation was the bus. The location was Coralitos Women's Club. Uh, we also had the American Dream Scholarship, and there were four students select selected. There were Stanique, Fritzy, Renee, and me as well. We were <laughs> each received $500. Wow, good for you. And then uh, we, have, we had an opportunity to um, have Chef Jamie from Food Smith come to our cafeteria, and we were making uh, tofu with stir fry. And um, another Friday, we made chicken alfredo <coughs> with cauliflower puree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, our end of year field trips um, is Growing Up Wild, which I believe is next week on Tuesday. It's uh, the end of the program celebration. Uh, we want to have a barbecue and we're going to have community projects. And our very last one is on Thursday and that's to Alcatraz. We're going to take a boat ride there and we're actually able to take our phones to take photos. Okay. Our last week of school, um, it, on, like on Monday and Tuesday, we're going to have the white soccer tournaments at the Soccer Central. On Thursday, June 6th, we're going to have field day. And on the last day of school, field day, field day is like playing around. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and um, the last day of school, uh, we are going to have our staff cook for us breakfast. Um, you know what? I'm going to come back to that. Uh, for the software, um, we're going to have the end of the year tournament, which is on the 24th of this month. And on the 31st, we're going to have All-Stars versus Coaches. For graduation, it's going to occur on June 5th at 3 p.m. It's going to be in the Mellow Center. Uh, our gowns actually already arrived. The women wear um, white gowns and the men wear green gowns. Uh, our diplomas were ordered and also scholarships were given out. 
And here's the rotary student. Um, here's my friend Matthew. And I'm on the left, as you can see. So thank you. We're going to have a couple of students of the year. Um, the first one is from the Pacific Coast Charter School, Sean Manin, Manger. Manger. Am I saying it right? Manger. Okay.
The next one is from the Watsonville Charter School of the Arts, Misael Germán Cruz Hout. Okay, so a little bit less exciting. 
approval of the agenda. Can I have a motion? Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Seven zero. Okay. Ooh, that's exciting. <laughs> Approval of May 8th board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion?
printers, classroom robots, coding electives, and just began exploring the world of developing environments with virtual reality. A few months ago, I was approached by the Charter School Association to see if I would like to obtain a performance review for this charter renewal. As a person who is always open to feedback and advice on how to make our school even better than it already is, of course I said yes. Throughout the process, we made available all of our school data, answered the numerous questions they asked, as well as provided them with our charter petition, and I am proud to announce that their board determined that WCSA has met the academic threshold for their support on our charter renewal. WCSA is determined to close our achievement gap. As you can see from our CASP comparisons, which compares WCSA to the like demographic schools, WCSA saw a dip in CASP scores in 2017, but rebounded in 2018 and has shown positive growth, growth in the last three years. We are proud of how we rank in PBUSD and hope to improve our scores in the third and sixth grade by the end of this school year. We plan to address some of our shortcomings by implementing SIPs with school-wide fidelity in the 2019-20 school year, pilot a new math program for K-8, adjust the middle school schedule for sixth grade, and disband our four five combination class creating two fourth and two fifth grade classrooms. The future of WCSA is strong, and we have a plan that addresses our academic shortcomings. We are extremely hopeful for the future of WCSA. While we know we are not perfect or where we would like to be academically yet, we have no doubt we will be able to get there. I wholeheartedly believe that WCSA is one of the best schools on the planet. Our school motto is where creativity takes courage. I welcome you to WCSA any time to see this in action. We have happy and engaged children, happy and dedicated teachers and staff, and happy, happy and extremely helpful parents, an active home and school parent organization, and a principal who's excited to come to work every day. Small plug, next Thursday is Shrek the Musical. It's amazing. I may or may not be in it. <laughs> Thank you for allowing us to submit this charter petition to you all, as well as collaborate and innovate with the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. We look forward to our partnership in the next five years. Thank you for your time.
has meant so much to me. Currently, I'm a sophomore in high school, but I attended Baltimore Charter School of the Arts for six years, and those six years were incredible. All my teachers were loving and kind, and they taught me so many things that I need to know. And before I went to Watsonville Charter School of the Arts, um, I didn't really have anything. Like, I was searching for something. I loved art, I loved to paint, and I wanted that community, but I couldn't find it. And when I attended Watsonville Charter School of the Arts, it just changed my life, and it was so incredible. And with all these teachers I see up here today that um, I, I've all had, like Ms. Kwan, Ms. HP, and Ms. Yale, they were all incredible. And actually, um, the one of the reasons I wanted to be marine biologist is because Ms. Kwan, but yeah, so. All the teachers taught me so many different things about theater and art and science, and you should definitely renew the charter because it's so incredible. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's so incredible for all the kids. My brother and sister currently go here. And it's just so fun to watch them like in the community um, with all the teachers. And Amy's definitely changed my life as a person. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next we have Natalia Hammond.
teachers is Kwan. And I love school because it's a beautiful place and all the teachers are kind. We share respect and everyone in the school is supposedly kind and we can be wherever we want to be at the school. And all the teachers are here to help other children learn and do lots of stuff that they're capable to do. And they're intelligent. Thank you very much. Next we have Greg Calvi. Thank you, uh, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, I come from the East Coast, and I was lucky enough to attend a fancy private boarding school and was planning on going to Yale, but um, I had the grades, I graduated with honors, but my art teacher, he inspired me to attend an art school instead. So I went to Pratt Institute in New York. From that background, I am very appreciative of the arts as a key form of uh, education, in addition to the regular academic parts. And I have to say, with two, two children in the school, uh, who have done very well there academically, and one is, is also going to the Invention of Convention Nationals, uh, I'm also an inventor. I've got several patents, and I design bicycles, and have a small bicycle company here in Watsonville, uh, with 25 employees. So I've had some success with invention and I credit that success with my arts education. I find it rare to find, to see arts education uh, featured in a school and that's why we chose Charter, a Watsonville Charter School for the Arts to send our children to. So I encourage you to please uh, renew this charter from an academic point of view. I, I'm impressed, and I come from a, a place where academic rigor is, is important, and I uh, really appreciate the fact that this school exists, and I'm really happy to, uh, to participate on the, uh, the uh, advisory board for the school, and I do quite a lot of volunteer work. So, um, with that said, um, you have my endorsement, and I really hope Everything goes smoothly with lots of great funding for more facilities. <laughs> Thank you very much. Next we have Kyle and Amber Barton.
uh, in the beginning of his school year, Kyle struggled because he had he enjoyed the friendship so much. The friendships that he didn't have that he now had, right? So he his his grades were struggling. And now last the last report card, all A's and B's. You know, he's just shot up. <laughs> Love this school, and I, I appreciate your time to listen to us, especially listening to you
had a huge part in my own life. I was classically trained as a musician, I was a dancer. Um, a lot of the things that meant a lot to me um, had to do with art. So when I thought about myself as a learner and what meant the most to me, it was the arts. So having the opportunity to teach and integrate and use art and use science and use my own experience to make learning more meaningful was, was a very powerful uh, opportunity. And it has been a very wonderful opportunity to be able to work with kids and see them really light up and see that happy, happy smile when they're dancing or when they're uh, creating and see them go into that creative part of their mind and see them apply it to problem solving and critical thinking. Um, I'm a huge proponent of the arts. I think it helps you to develop your soul and your spirit. And I um, think that we're also doing a lot of great work to continue to grow them um, academically so that they'll be successful wherever they are. Um, I'm very proud of our school and I hope that you really consider us. I'm renewing our charter to absolutely continue to grow artists and um, continue to light up these beautiful kids with things that are interesting to them and meaningful to them and uh, make the learning something that integrates things that they hear. Seeing movies, the theater isn't just a part of something you see when you turn on a TV, but it's something that helps you with interpersonal skills. Seeing the dancing isn't just something that you see on a TV show, it's not something that's just from Fortnite, but it's something that's going to really help you to control your body and space and to learn how to work with other people and communicate with other people. Um, I think the arts are so powerful and it's such a rare opportunity to be able to grow people and encourage them to grow in lots of different ways. Um, I'm very proud of our school, I'm very proud of our students, and I want to thank you for your time and um, encourage you to renew our charter. Thank you so much. Thank you. Last but not least, we have Melissa Shaw. Tenacious administrators 
to pursue professional development that aligns with our own interests and growth goals. Empowerment. My time is truncated here, but the impact that is happening at our school is extensive. Amy shared snapshots of the empirical evidence that supports it. And may our authentic voices also offer a glimpse of all that is amazing at our school. Thank you for welcoming our perspectives and voices. Empowerment. Next up, we have Oren. Uh, good evening, Board of Trustees and Michelle Rodriguez. Uh, today I'm here for the uh, City Council of the City of Washington District 2. Uh, but I'm also a uh, Little League uh, coach and manager for the Top of Little League. But I'm actually really proud to say that uh, I've had a lot of these students from Washington Charter School of Arts on my team. And they're, they're very well-rounded individuals. And I, I take any, any of the students from Moscow Charter School uh, to be on my baseball team. Uh, and just for the purpose of, they are well-rounded. Uh, and I did have Benjamin Duarte on my team. I, I did know him. He's a head of the future, and I wish he would continue to play baseball. But anyways, uh, we, in, on top of LA, we do have a lot of new students on the Watson Charter. And, and they are really amazing kids. So. Keep this charter going, right? Thank you. Hey, thank you so much. And very impressive, all the comments from especially the young people, but the teachers and everybody else, too. Thank you. Very impressive. Um, so, is there any discussion from the board? <laughs> The arts are very important. I've learned when I was younger, <clears throat> I used to paint murals around this town, and I learned that painting, art, painting, drawing, singing, dancing is another form of language. And thank you for much of his presentations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My daughter went there too. <laughs> and Jennifer, you go ahead. Your, your children go there too. <laughs> so my daughter goes to well, the Temple Charter School of the Arts. She's in first grade. And anyone who knows me personally knows my daughter has a lot of anxiety um, with going to school. And I just want to say that the school has been wonderful at working with parents of children that do have some special needs. And they really put those children first and we want to give them a chance to learn their voices and to learn that it's okay to share their voices. Thank you. Any more comments? Yeah. My daughter loved going there, too. <laughs> All right. So this is not an action item until next time. Okay, Maria, do you, you want to say something, too? Can I ask some questions about data? Do you mind approaching? So, nice presentation. Thank you. So, can you tell us a little bit about, like, the nitty gritty, to the, some of your data points, and with regard to any of the standardized testing? Can you clarify what data points you would like me to address? Just the CAS scores and the UEA. How we get now, I mean, anything that would give this board an indication that the kids are making the achievement that we we hope. Uh, well, like you can see from the the board the presentation and in our charter petition, we are in the top five of the schools in the whole district in that growth. Um, so our students are growing above the growth conditional index um, to a positive uh, rather than a negative. So that's what we want. We want to see them growing. Uh, we're not we're not all the way perfect yet, but we our students are showing growth every grade level except for third and sixth this year, which is why we're working so hard in third and sixth this year. And is that why you've um, put into place the AVID program? We started the AVID program last summer because we wanted to send our students to high school with the tools that they needed to be successful. And we're not using it as an elective program. We're using it as a program for all the teachers to, to use with all of the students in middle school. 
Great, good job. Thank you. And so how are they doing stuff like language arts and all those things? I'm sure, I'm, I know you're, they're doing, I know you're way up there. Yeah, they're teaching, uh, my, my teachers are teaching everything that the Common Core Standards say they say, that say that they need to teach with an arts infusion. Yeah, no, I know. So they're teaching arts. it all. I know you have arts infusion. It's pretty cool. And we teach language arts. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering if you could speak to any um, opportunities, places that you'd like to grow or improve. I have a growth mindset. I feel that there's always room for improvement and I'm open and, and willing to hear feedback from anyone. I think that the biggest concern for our community right now is our facilities. So we've, we've improved so much in the last five years, but we have some room to grow in that area as well. I would love to see a foreign language taught at our school. Um, that comes with having extra facilities and extra uh, staff members to do so. Um, but I think that our kids are ready for high school and beyond, which is the most important to me. Any other comments? Okay. Oh, Georgia.
think you just turned your microphone off. There you go. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was really impressed in, in the way that, you know, the, the teacher engaged students and just their ability to follow instructions immediately from one activity to the next. Um, so it was a really neat experience. Um, I have a question regarding your population of students. So what percentage of our population are special ed? Um, and then English language learners. I'm going to regurgitate some numbers and I might get it wrong. It is in my charter petition. It's not memorized, but I believe we have 17% EL students and 23% special ed students. Thank you, and as far as the services that you provide? We have a full-time RSP teacher. So all of our students that have IEPs, their minutes and service is followed by the IEP. Um, we have an, an intervention program after school and before school for English learners that can come and work on their foundational English skills. And we immerse all of the kids in the arts and our students are, are fepping by the time they're in fourth or fifth grade. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, and thank you, all of you that came up to speak. Thank you. Okay, now we're having visitor non-agenda items, number seven. So, Karen, if point of order, please, if you can please close up the clearing and then open the regular meeting. Oh, I guess we have to do that. We have to close. Close the hearing. First off, we have Alondra Morales.
Uh, presently, it's 15% of our budget. In 12 years, that the amount of money we spend on our health benefits will double. That's creating and already has created a crowding out of the budget so that we have less and less money that we can give to our teachers and our classified employees. So 12 years from now, you'll actually have to cut the wages of our teachers and classify them because our health benefits will be sucking up too much of our money. So, I've asked in the past that we should be having a review. $40 million we spend on health benefits. We've never had a review. Does anybody know what, how much is being spent on claims of that 40 million? No. And why don't we know? Because we never had a review. So my suggestion is put it on the agenda. Let's have a review. Let's see what's going on with our health benefits. Is it being managed well? I have no idea because we've never reviewed it. Okay, second subject. I want to compliment the uh, district. Uh, it was a wonderful idea to have the meeting here. It's a, <coughs> a ploy in uh, negotiating with the unions because it's cold in here. As you know, I have my coat on, I have to wear it up. Uh, but by showing that we don't have enough money to keep the building, our budgets are too tight. So, way to go. Nice point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Stacy Anderson. Hi, board. Um, I'm here today because I have some concerns about our staffing. What are you guys going to be doing about recruitment for getting us some more teachers? We I have two kids in the South of the apartment. Um, we've had kids that have had um, substitute teachers for the last year. They haven't had a permanent teacher. We don't have enough continuing education for our gen ed teachers that are having to deal with the staff and the kids that have autism, for example. And so many of our kids are in general education now. They've been um, in the least restricted environment, the LRA. And unfortunately, these gen ed teachers don't know how to handle these behaviors. So how are we, as a district, going to support our staff in teaching these gen ed teachers how to handle that? I'm just, I'm here to ask for help or our teachers, our kids, because they need it. I see a lot of support for the charter school, which is great. They're doing fantastic things, and they have a lot of new fancy things. We have a lot of schools that don't have them. I have a kid that's doing APE in a hallway. That's really, I don't think, beneficial. I personally think that we really need to reevaluate our priorities and start putting our best foot forward. Get our teachers some good continuing education so they know how to handle our kids, so they can help us and help support them better instead of just sending them to the principal's office because they're misbehaving and that's not fair to them. We have Tammy, then after Tammy, we have Sophia and Alyssa. Hi, Hello, good evening. Thank you all for your service. It's an important job and not always fun. So, um, I have something to share. I'm sure you all know that 
Research demonstrates that meaningful engagement of families in their children's education positively impacts school readiness and later academic success. I know you guys know that. There's higher academic achievement. They, en they enroll in more challenging academic programs. They have better attendance at school. They have improved behavior at home and at school. And they have better social skills and adjustment to school. And we want those outcomes for all of our students, right? So, um, what my personal goal is to have, I'm a TK teacher at Ann Soldo, my personal goal is to have one adult from every family authorized as a volunteer to be able to help out in the classroom, to be able to attend field trips and so on. However, the procedure for becoming an authorized volunteer is burdensome. And so I would like to see us as a school district make um, make it as convenient as possible for families to become authorized as volunteers. I totally support the safety concerns for wanting for them to be authorized. Um, I spoke with one of my colleagues and she said, I asked her today, do you think I should go to the board meeting and share this? And she said, I did a few years ago the same exact thing that you want to do tonight. I proposed the same exact thing. And what I would like to see happen is I would like to see the school district provide um, medical professionals to go to the schools and, and um, do TB testing, and then also go back to read the TB test so the families don't have to take two trips to the doctor, and then also to have a mobile live scan program where, um, the, where the school district could come out to schools and do the fingerprinting so that the families don't have to um, take two trips to the doctor and at least one trip to HR. <clears throat> That's burdensome to some families, especially the families whose students are at the most risk. That's the most burdensome for those families. So, um, yeah, so anyway, that's my idea. And it's something I feel very passionate about. And I am a more effective teacher when I have more adults in my classroom, especially TK. Hardly anybody buddy comes in with their children, all, with their parent already authorized as a volunteer. I get a few, but not very many. <clears throat> so that burden comes on me to try to make sure the parents are authorized. And please make my dream a reality. Thank you. Thank you. of Trustee Orozco, we did change, to my re recollection, and, and please, Trustee DeSerpa and Osmondson, help me on this, um, how we do our TB testing, that we are now, it is, we are providing that at a fee-free service. So we have moved in some positive direction over the last two years on this, so to say that we haven't done anything in the last two years is really incorrect. I do hear what you're asking about, well, that would be nice to have the ability to have satellite locations come on site, but I do want to recognize the previous governing board, which four of us were a part of, and particularly Trustee Rosco, for having greeted the TB testing screening issue up front, and that was addressed over the last two years. So thank you, Trustee Rosco. It's Sophia's the name, Sophia. Good evening, board members. My name is Sophia Elizalde, and I am currently a senior at Watsonville High. Over my years at WHS, I have been given many opportunities to excel. My teachers have thought above and beyond for both myself and my peers. I will be forever with forever grateful to the WHS teachers that have defined my high school experience and pushed me to succeed. It is due to their undying support and encouragement that I have been able to make it as far as I have. Unfortunately, I cannot say in full confidence that my teachers have been granted the same support from the district. Every year, I am forced to say goodbye to teachers simply because they can no longer afford to live in the area. These teachers did not want to leave. 
Instead, they were forced to make the decision between staying with PUSD or fulfilling their own personal goals. Whether it was starting a family in a place they could afford to, wanting the option to retire earlier, or wanting to not have to take on supplemental jobs, I do not blame them for their decisions. The loss of these exceptional teachers is a symptom of a larger problem that PUSD contributes to. The teacher pay penalty is the percent by which public school teachers are paid less than comparable workers. Teachers' wages have stagnated since the mid-90s, reaching a wage penalty of 18.7% in 2017. This gap only continues to grow larger. Improvements to benefits for teachers compared to professionals have not been enough to offset the growing wage penalty. These are facts um, backed up by a recent study completed by the Center on Wage and Employment Dynamics at UC Berkeley and the Economic Policy Institute. There is no incentive outside of altruism for college graduates to choose a career in teaching. The shortage of teachers we face is a result of this reality. If we want our children to succeed, we must ensure that effective teachers, at our, we must ensure that effective teachers are at our school. Compensation is a major component to the retention of experienced teachers and the recruitment of qualified individuals. We should strive for a future where teaching is a highly sought after profession, where preparing our youth to be the future leaders of our country is a point of pride. When I come back to Watson High, I want to see it thriving. I do not want this exodus of great teachers to continue. This is why I urge the district to invest in our students by prioritizing fair teacher compensation when deciding the allocation of funds in the school years to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have Alyssa Wagner, and then we have Becky Steinbrenner and Sean Schrum come up. Good evening, my name is Alyssa Wagner, retired from Cabrillo College where I taught English and environmental ethics. I'm also now a volunteer and docent with the Watsonville Wetlands Watch, and I am also a member of the Friends of the Swallows at Pajaro Valley High School. The Cliff, the cliff Swallows at Pajaro Valley High School are migrants who make the long trek all the way from Argentina every year affording this high school with its mandate to be environmentally oriented a unique opportunity to educate. And thanks to Joe Dominguez's advocacy for the Swallows, students at the high school are able both to learn and to teach about these amazing birds, to coexist with nature, not dominate or destroy it. We are all very fortunate that Mr. Dominguez has set a stellar example by giving a voice to the swallows, reminding us to be good stewards of the earth, our one precious planet. Thank you. My name is Becky Steinbrenner. I'm a resident of Aptos, but I am also one of the friends of the Cliff Swallows at Pajaro Valley High School. A year ago, I um, made an appointment to talk with Mr. Dominguez at the high school. It was not going well. The notes were being knocked down, the staff was upset, the students were upset, and the birds were very upset. And I went ready for a fight. <laughs> and I met Jerry Dominguez at the campus, and we walked around and talked, and he looked at me and said, you're right, we can do better. And that was the best meeting I've ever had. <laughs> it's it's, a, it's a, a true honor to come across a person like Mr. Dominguez that I consider a hero. He's turned things around at the school. He's taken a risk. He's been willing to work with staff and students. And now things are much better. It has cost some money, but it cost a whole lot more before trying to keep the birds from nesting. I really want to thank Joe Dominguez, and I really want to thank the staff and the students who are making this story a success. As these birds, as Elisa said, come from Argentina every year to raise their young. They don't raise young in Argentina, they come here to raise their young. And that's a great story for what's going on in Watsonville and the Pajaro Valley. It's a great learning tool. 
And thanks to Joe Dominguez, Pajaro Valley High School is supporting it, enriching the experience and educating our students and their families and the staff and the community. And we really want to thank him. We have um, a little presentation here for him. Joe, yeah, we can't thank you enough. Um, what we're giving Joe here is a framed picture of a, a photo that was in the Registered Pajaronian highlighting a work day last fall that he came to and you came to, Ms. Serpa, and students and staff came to. And it really was a great event. And it is signed by staff, students, some of the Watsonville Wetland Steward who are now going out and uh, they have educated themselves to go out and, and teach other students about what's going on there with the swallows. Thank you, Joe. We really, really appreciate it.
And my teacher thinks now that we're going to have three schools in this area. Right now we're two. And I have witnessed the traffic growth, the incidents. So now with the new school that's coming here, I'm asking the board to please uh, keep an eye and monitor the traffic. Because I've been witness, I have witnessed incidents uh, where people have gotten hit, children getting close to getting hit, different situations, people that were parking. And now to me, and for some other residents around here, it's getting, it's getting to be no regular because of the amount of traffic. And so hopefully we can work with the city of Watsonville and with the school district to monitor and to also keep it a safe area from California right here to this area to Bloomington. Uh, because right now we already have quite a bit of problems, especially in Bloomington coming down the hill, uh, the speeding. Um, sometimes I'll stand and make sure that the kids from each point are able to cross safely. And that's not including my own children, my own family members. So area of concern is the traffic, and hopefully it will not be a nightmare. So maybe the first month we can have uh, some um, articulation with the city where we can have a, a policeman or someone visible that can control and, uh, the traffic and help us with children being able to cross the street safely. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next up, we have a witness. Good evening again, uh, Aurelio Gonzalez uh, with the City Council. Uh, just to give you guys an update on the syringe uh, incident, the, the Harm uh, Resources Coalition has pulled their request for certification. So for now, we have a victory because uh, they are not going to get a certification to distribute any type of syringes within the city of limits of Watsonville. Uh, the California Health Department will notify us again when we have the 45 days that they resubmit. And so once again, uh, we will be submitting our letters. The city of Watson will be protesting it. I'm also on the board for the Salvation Army, and, and we, we do, do not want it in the Salvation Army area. Um, so I'll make sure as long as I'm on that board that, that that's what we're the standing take on, on that. The other thing is, I'd like to invite you to Music in the Park on uh, September 19th. Uh, it's a good event that's going to happen. Uh, the Papa Valley Unified School District is going to be collaborating with the Santa Cruz Symphony, and hopefully we'll be having some young artists, musicians playing on the first half of uh, Music in the Park on September 19th, and then on the other half, we'll have uh, the Santa Cruz Symphony doing a performance. And this is a project that I took upon myself. And, uh, and it's fulfilling. So it's going to be a good event. I hope to see you all out there. Uh, the other thing is on the 25th of May and the 26th of May, we will be refurbishing the mural at the Metro Center. And I don't know if any of you know the mural. I know it. I'm hoping that lots of little uh, artists go here. But uh, we do need volunteers to go out there and throw some brushes out on that mural. Uh, I, I also, on that one, I took that project on, I said it on the Metro Board, and I thought it was important for a community to maintain that mural. Uh, it's a historical mural, and so with that, I was able to get funding for it, and uh, so that's going to go on. And there's also going to be another new mural added on to the Metro. So there's going to be uh, community input, input for it, and so I'd like, really like to see the Papa Valley Unified School District with teachers and artists and everybody out there getting involved in that. Okay? Thank you. Um, Thank you. I think that's it. Right, thanks. <laughs> Next up, we have Robert Lock.
I respectfully disagree with this assessment for the following reasons. Number one, while we clearly want our students to be able to use 21st century technology, they are not trained in any facet of computer science or data process. I piloted a program, piloted a program in the fall, and my students clearly required instruction in fundamental data process. Website, website navigation and basic keyboarding are foreign to them, and classroom times consume teaching machine technology. The science curriculum became secondary to tasks as simple as determining where an assignment was located on a website and how to submit that assignment once it was completed. Written responses were agonizingly slow because the students had not been trained in touch typing. I'm talking about seventh graders here. They simply hunt and peck, which incidentally is a very bad habit for them to develop. Clearly, the adoption of a digital-only curriculum will bog down science instruction by forcing instructors to teach data processing in lieu of the science curriculum. Number two, purchasing textbooks does not mean abandoning technology. All textbook publishers include a digital component in their curriculum. They provide websites that include a variety of digital text and activities. The choice between the hard copy and digital provides greater flexibility. In short, if you buy textbooks, you get both. Number three, California Ed Code section 60119 requires that schools provide sufficient textbooks aligned with current standards. Purchase of NGSS, that's the Next Generation Science Standards, aligned textbooks that include a digital component would clearly satisfy this regulation. Compliance with these familiar Williams regulations can best be assured by purchasing new textbooks. Finally, it seems that the search, of, the search for a perfect digital platform is never ending. The district office has been experimenting with various web-based curricula and proposing assorted pilot programs for several years now. As a matter of fact, I'm going to a, another symposium this summer that where we're going to review four more digital uh, curricula. Uh, one must wonder if there is any incentive to ever resolve this issue. I respectfully request that the district purchase enough textbooks for our students. We need three sets of integrated science textbooks aligned with the next generation science standards. Mr. Hunt? Am I minutes. not time? No. Yeah. Yeah, time. More than two minutes. All right, I'm sorry. I, I'll, I'll, I'll skip to the skip to the point. Um, basically, uh, there's a there's a maximum. You, you have to you, you cannot read to learn until you learn to read. The students, you can use the same maxim. The students cannot use computers to learn until they learn to use computers. Um, if we're going to go all digital, we need to, we need to teach them how to use computers. You can't just give a 10-year-old a, a, a PC and expect them to know what to do with it. Thank you. Sorry for the, going over my time. Thank you. Okay, we're going to have the employees organizations, unions, um, Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. Do we have somebody here? Okay.
So, um, as you know, we've been in support of these charter school laws to bring sensible charter school law reform into being. And today, we have good news, today in Sacramento, I got this update, AB 1505, which some of us went back, we went to Sacramento the law before a couple of weeks ago, received the necessary votes to get out of the assembly. AB 1505 will bring back local control, oops, to school boards. So that um, when the school board denies a charter or approves a charter, our decision stands. Yay! 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 <laughs> I'm talking about private charters, of course. We love our charter schools that are democratically run and accountable to the public, such as Watsonville Charter School of the Arts, Alianza, etc. Okay, now, the bill still has a way to go. So we will continue to request your support. Continue to request your support um, and that of the public also to ensure sensible charter school law reform. Second point, and I'll be done. As a reminder, PDFT respectfully expects to be a full and equal participant in the implementation, which is coming up, of full day kinder classes, the English language master plan, which we'll be talking about tonight, and the implementation of dual learning centers, the special ed plan for learning centers at every site. We'll be glad to be able to work with you all and with the administration in the, in the implementation of these three important things. Okay, thank you very much, y'all. Good night. Thank you. Okay, California School Employees Association. Good evening, Dr. Rodriguez, President Karen Osmondson, and Board of Trustees. Today I was happy uh, to award our first Robert Bobby Salazar Scholarship at Aptos High School. Wow. Again, I want to thank Dr. Rodriguez and the Board of Trustees for all your love and support for the Salazar family. We truly appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, looking forward to our nego upcoming negotiations. Um, I also met with Kristen South earlier this week in regards to Watsumo Relay for Life. So she's guaranteed me your support. <laughs> well, we're going to try really hard. Um, looking forward to the end of this year and the beginning of the new one with lots of success. Thank you very much. W.A. Communication Workers of America. Okay, and number nine, our action items. This one's a very important action item. It's about the master plan for English learners, 9.1. Good evening. Hi, Michael Gerber. He's the one going to do it. <laughs> Director of Equity and State and Federal Global Programs and Accountability. Members of the board, Dr. Rodriguez. I have to tell you, I apologize. I misread how much time I had, so this presentation is longer than the minutes allotted, so I will go quickly. I do want to say that you've seen me a lot this year um, for some good stuff. This is the highlight for me. This is this is some, some really good stuff. And I have no credit in this other than being part of the team. The team started before I got involved. For the last two years, they've been working arduously to um, update the prior plan and then um, dramatically add to it in a visionary piece. And that's kind of what I want to talk mostly about. Um, quickly, the plan that we had was very compliance-based. It talked about the things that we needed to have in a master plan and the services and procedures that we need to have for our English learners. Um, a little context, Global 2030 um, calls for, by, by, by the year 2030, half of our graduating seniors to be 
bilingual and biliterate, those, are, those students are in first grade right now. So this is, this is something that is current and it's in our schools and we are, as, as we talked about last time, we are increasing the numbers of students graduating with the seal of biliteracy. We need to continue that progress. Um, also, in to con to context, the English Learner Roadmap, which we'll be talking about in the next item, um, really calls for four principles to, to actualize the, the Prop 58. First two, assets oriented and needs responsive schools, and, and intellectual quality of instruction and meaningful access. Those are, the, those are the key priorities. The next two are really about the systems, conditions, and alignment that we have throughout our district and county to support those first two. Sorry. Um, that is, and, and, and another piece of context is we know that our students can achieve. Uh, there's a lot of research coming out, including the Opportunity Myth, that says when we provide these, these particular things, our students, regardless of their language, their, their background, they can achieve. We need to make sure that we're providing that. And this encourages the asset-based mindset. Um, so this, this new master plan for English learner success is built on um, the revisions of the, of the previous one, but also on, on research, best practices, and new legislation. It's driven by the vision that the team created, followed by the theory of action and the steps required to achieve the goals established. Uh, it's broken down into three key component parts. The language development approach, we call the LDA, is what we want to see in every classroom. The core educator capacities are what we want all of our educators, administrators, teachers, everyone to, the skills and understandings that we want, all want to possess in order to achieve the LDA that we want to see in our classroom and provide our students with the greatest opportunity to succeed. And the instructional models that we currently have and also with language about where we want to see them go and, and, and which ones are, are endorsed by, by research. Um, I'm going to skip through most of these. I do want to read the vision statement because I do believe it's powerful. We honor and develop the cultural and linguistic assets of all students by providing rigorous and equitable academic opportunities, enabling all English learners to graduate with multiple post-secondary options. Um, I, I believe that, that comes from the, the target of success, the, the mission and, and vision of the district, and really um, crystallizes what the intent of this document is about. Um, one thing that we've been sharing and talking a lot about with all the teams that we've been taking this to is we have a lot of great things happening in our district, a lot of initiatives, and rather than viewing as district siloed things, we see with this, the Yale Roadmap and the Master Plan as a, as a larger lens, we see the opportunities for great alignment. And we're really seeing the more that we, the more that we develop this and the more that we see, see what else is going on, the more we see those places where we can really read everything together and, and make sure that, that when we're talking about PBIS or science or SIPs or foundational literacy, that we are talking about best practices for English learners as well. Um, I'm going to skip through some of, the, some of the, the text. One thing that's really highlighted is that we need to make sure that we build integrated ELD into all that we do. We need to make sure that we have academic language in all that we do, not just the designated ELD time. So this is just a quick graphic to show most of the day needs to have um, academic language in it. Um, these are the core capacities that the team has identified, as, and the idea is that over the next five years, um, starting with administration and coaches and ELSs, we would like to, we're going to be developing these modules, professional development modules, that will provide um, interrelated, these are interrelated concepts and, 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 and skills. Our goal is to build these modules so that they build upon each other, um, so that in the, in, in, within the next five years, all of our current staff will have the skills and understandings in order to best provide for our students. Quick timeline, this is a possible timeline, it's already outdated, but really what it shows is that it, it's probably going to take each individual three to four years to go through the sequence of ten modules, and it has entry points for any new employees as they come. Um, it does uh, talk about our, our instructional models. I'm imagining that this is a place that there's going to be a lot of conversation and dialogue in the future. A couple quick shout outs to what, to what is changing in this. Um, you'll notice number one is the Academic Language and Literacy, the ALL program. Currently we have SEIs, uh, um, we have EO, and we have ELM we have all in one classroom. That's where English is the predominant language or the only language being, being instructed in. Um, what this does is it establishes the language development approach that we have as the, as the core of what that program is. 
in support of all of our programs. Um, the, the, the dual language program, the goal at, at, the end of, at the end of K-5 is biliteracy. And then the early exit transitional model, um, it is still a current model, but we do call out explicitly that it's not supported by research. Um, as indicated in this graph, I know that my time's up. I can keep going, or you guys can ask questions. I'm pretty sure there's any questions linked to that. Do this slide. Please ask me to do this slide. Basically, this is, this is um, long-term data on students in different programs. So if you see the SEI program, um, that start, that, that's, that's a program that has a lot, a lot more English, um, the, the, the English immersion. It starts off with greater academic progress, but in the long run, those students perform worse on ac academic indicators than the students of the other, in, enrolled in the other programs. The next one that, sh that starts off higher and ends up lower is the early exit program that I called out. Um, late exit is a model currently in two of our elementary schools, and then there's a dual language model, which, which, are, which we are trying to build and increase um, and improve throughout our district with more schools. We have a theory of action, followed by um, the step-by-step -step process that we need to, to go through to achieve our goals. And then I have a question. Yes,
I, I, I don't know what the dynamics of that would be look like, look like, but I would welcome it. The idea is that once we have the modules built, it's not going to be me nor, the, nor, nor just the coordinator that are going out and doing the PD. The idea is to have the team that built it start doing the professional development, starting with, the, starting with administrators, and then as, as certain individuals gain uh, proficiency and confidence with those pieces of it, maybe they take one module on, maybe they take all the modules on, but the idea is to build the capacity within the district because we have a lot of talent and skill in our district it would be to disseminate that in a way that so many of us have those, the, the, not only the skills to implement it, but also the skills to train it and, and make, it a, make it a systematic piece of, our, of what we do, of business as usual in our district. So, just looking at a question for you. So, um, through Allison Izawa, our director of certificated, she is going to already be doing a um, a support set support session during SBC days with our um, with all of our substitutes. So she currently has a plan in place during the SBC days in order to be able to do that. Um, and she will be working there doing the meat of the program right now. A lot of it is compliance, but also directed towards um, effective instruction for our students. And so. I'm sure that they will partner together to be able to look at those modules and do pieces of those modules um, as we move forward with it. But that will start occurring um, at the beginning of next year during the SBC days, which are days in which we provide professional development to all of our permanent and temporary teachers, and there are no students present, so it's the perfect time to do so. Great. I just want to make sure that that gets addressed, um, because I know even at Fairland Elementary, we have some issues there with subs and um, I just want to make sure that our kids are getting the full benefit. <laughs> and, part of, and part of the theory of action and action steps calls for um, a lot of work between our department and, and human resources to ensure that, that we, if we are going to grow our programs, we need to make sure that we're hiring um, credentialed teachers, BCLAT teachers, to, to, to fill those roles. And then the other thing is, um, as far as the programs that we have currently in place, I think we're all over the place, right? <laughs> so, um, are we looking as far as this process of moving towards just one model for all schools that no. currently offer by the full programs, or what's the plan? So, one of the things that the, that the plan calls for is the development of two teams. One of them is the um, the leadership council, which is a monitoring body. The idea is that there's, there will be teachers and administrators. Um, and if possible, community members and parents involved. And that is the monitoring body that will look at the, the, the established benchmarks and timelines that we have and, and help us um, stay on track. And, and if we get off track, help us help support um, us as a district to get back on track. The other team is called, it was called the BLT, but everybody laughs about that one. Um, it's the dual language leadership team. And that team, again, um, consisting of of teachers and administrators that have a passion for and knowledge of dual language programs, that team will get together, do some intensive training, and then they will be the guides to support sites when, when parents and staff say, hey, we really want to move towards these programs, help us get there, we will have a body in place to do that. Okay. And, and, it, and it's based on parent desires, it's, it, it's parent preference, it's based on um, capacity, and it's also based on, on what the community, the local community of that school, for example, as you see in number two, we have a lot of different kinds of dual language programs. They would have, you know, that that, that community would decide what's best for them. Okay, and is there a process that we're currently working on to ensure that parents are aware of how they can voice their opinion as far as what program they want to see at their schools or advocate on their child's behalf if there's currently no program there? So we, you know, we just went through FPM and that was one of the items that they looked at and we did need compliance on that. But I'll contend, I'll contest that, that I think we do need to go to the next step to actually say rather than just do you want an alternative program, um, if you could, what would that program be? So we're, we have a couple sites that we are that we're piloting a different kind of questionnaire, um, and and we're we're in the we're in the early phases of that. But the intention is to is to get more accurate an, a, a more accurate understanding of what parents want in each Great. And then hopefully as part of that process we uh, go away with, with this trend of discrimination.
discouraging parents to sign up their kids um, into their school programs. So that's my hope. The, the, goal is, the goal is to provide every opportunity possible to have students in the, in the, in the programs that their parents would like. Thank you. I, I did want to note, though, um, to continue to respond to your question, is going back to the graphic which shows which are the programs that actually have the highest impact on students. Um, we are supporting the programs that, and we're encouraging transition to the programs that provide the highest level of results. So as you can see from here, um, the early exit has significantly less results than late exit in dual language. And so we are in the process, it's not a force at this point, but we are in the process of encouraging people to look at the data and we know significantly that early exit does not provide as good of, of supports for our students as both late exit and dual language, dual language specifically. Thank you. And, and our hope is that with the all model, um, even that the SEI line will be raised because of the practices that are employed by the teachers in those classes as well. Um, so I just want to say, I mean, I would imagine obviously we have to really work super hard to be able to recruit teachers that have B clad or that they can get B clad um, to be able to move on to this more, you know, late exit or dual language programs. Um, and I would imagine we would be looking at having more schools, and obviously with parent involvement, become dual language schools. I mean, right now we're, we have Alianza, of course, and we're working with Freedom, right? And I would imagine that we would be looking towards having other schools besides just Freedom become dual language schools. And I'm not sure what is the going to be the next steps in terms of looking towards doing that in other schools. What is going to be the next steps? <laughs> you, you can tell them, you can, either of you. Um, yeah, that's, yeah they, I was thinking about Starlight. So, so a couple examples, Starlight and Hyde um, have different programs. Um, Hyde, is, Hyde is looking to Freedom as a leader school to, to emulate what they're doing, and so they're, they're starting their, their planning year next year. Um, where they're going to really dive in with their with their bilingual, bilingual team and see um, what the specifics of their program are. They're already K five school. Um, Freedom is, I mean, uh, Scotland is a 50 50 school, um, and they're pretty well established. So they're going to look at they're going to use this and um, and Jackie and Aaron are both members of the team um, that developed this plan, and so they're going to they're going to build on their understanding of of the team. We've also been talking to other schools that are K three that are early exit schools that are really passionate about it. And those are some of the schools that I mentioned about kind of piloting, what, what, having conversations about what would, what would it look like for those sites to, to go K-5, now that they're K-3, but strong K-3, and then take it K-5. Um, and again, it goes, the process goes back to um, establishing that, that, that DLLT and having that, that team um, uh, working with the teachers and, and the administrators on identifying what what the best version of the model would look like at that site. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? One thing I wanted to add about the, the staffing, it all, the plan also called out for um, working with local institutions and, and community members and trying to support you know, IAs becoming teachers, becoming B, you know, getting B clads, or teachers who are currently clad teachers becoming B clads. Um, trying to find as many ways into um, providing the, the teachers we need who are passionate about the programs. Thank you. Well, you're on our next one too, <laughs> Michael. Burton. So nine point two. Oh yeah, we are. We're in a, it is an action item. I forgot about that. Okay, I'm going to call for a motion. Yeah, we have a second. Yeah, me. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? <clears throat> so this is an action. So. 9.2 is the approve the resolution in support of Proposition 58 and the State Board of Education's EL Roadmap and report 
be by you. <laughs> yeah, I really, I really appreciate the last few resolutions that have been um, uh, translated. So I, I thought I would read a few of the highlights in both English and Spanish, if, if that's cool. Um, again, this, this resolution is uh, in support of Proposition 58, um, which is the, the Global Edge, and also the State Board of Education's EL Roadmap, both guides um, of, of the plan that we just discussed. Whereas Proposition, Proposition 58, Education for a Global Economy, passed by over 70% majority on November 8, 2016, reflecting California's strong support for preparing all students for college and careers, in a multilingual 21st century economy. Considerando que cerca de 42% de los estudiantes del distrito actualmente están aprendiendo inglés académico como segundo idioma y tienen la oportunidad de aprender tanto en inglés como en su idioma nativo para aumentar significativamente sus posibilidades de alto rendimiento en la escuela, lo que lleva a la educación superior. Whereas the district is committed to providing opportunities for monolingual English speaking students starting in ECE to be instructed to achieve proficiency in a second language so that they will better be, prepared, be better prepared to compete in the global workforce as multilingual speakers. Whereas the district is committed to aligning all of its programs and services for EL students with the state board's EL roadmap and is committed to providing all parents um, various language acquisition program options starting in ECE. Ahora, por lo tanto, sea el resultado que Power Valley Unified School District se compromete en, a, a desarrollar y fortalecer las opciones de programas de a, a, acquisición de idiomas para los estudiantes del distrito, que incluyen programas de doble inmersión, bilingües y de a, a, acquisición de idiomas en todo el mundo. Resolve that Pajaro Valley Unified School District is committed to evaluating current programs and services for the district EL students in order to determine what changes may be needed in order to ensure alignment with the State Board's EL roadmap. There you go. Okay, any discussion from the board? I'll make a motion. Now I'm on. I'll make a motion to approve this resolution. Services Agreement PSA 19016 <laughs> with UCSC for Gear Up. That's correct. So in October. Right, Christian Schaus. Christian Schaus. In October, uh, the board went through a partnership with um, U, uh, sorry, the University of Santa Cruz, the educational partnership with the Euro Grant, uh, really focusing on making sure that all of our students have the opportunity to really see that college is an option for them as well. Uh, as a result, we need to make sure that an MOU was in place to govern that work. It essentially covers facilities use, FERPA laws and regulations in regards to data, uh, in addition to fingerprinting laws, etc. Uh, the MOU put forth governs this work for the next five years. It is a seven-year grant, so we'll be bringing that back at that point um, to, to stay with it in our boundaries of MOUs as we've done in the district. So it'll go for five years. We'll come back to the board to extend those two years, but it is a seven-year process and partnership that we are looking at. Uh, and it's a, a process piece we are recommending approval of the MOU so that that work can continue. All right, any questions? Yeah, okay, yeah. No, in fact, as we've been talking about pathway computers and working with both Virginia and Sophia already, a lot of that is making sure that our students are graduating with both options. That really is the goal, is to be able to give our students options 
so that they can kind of decide what that looks like and the guidance to make that a decision as well. Um, our, the partnership has also lended itself to us embedding the Naviance program as well, so that vertical alignment that you're seeing move down to middle school as well as high school. Uh, Europe is involved in that work as well. So we're really just looking at, at the end of those seven years, we're doing these pieces that are very sustainable to our sites as well, which will help kind of carry that work forward. Uh, and our kids will be leaving high school with an entire student portfolio and options and career exploration as well as colleges that will fit what they're looking for as individuals. I just want to ask you exactly how they work gear up with all of our students in those high schools. I mean, what is the way that they, you know, go out there and work with students in order to... Sure, so it, it, it actually is a, a significant partnership, uh, which is incredibly flexible to the district as well. So part of that work is, that we've done on the backside of that is to sit down and have numerous conversations. But essentially what it looks like is the, the number of staff that they also support. So they do family outreach, parent education, uh, the Naviance scope and sequence they're working on, but they're also looking at the embedding of the pieces that we already have in place. So as we talk about EBIS, as we talk about MTSS, what are those roles and functions that they can help serve so that it really becomes a seamless system mm -hmm. of them integrating into our systems rather than just becoming a, a silo effect or another plate piece where people can't engage, how do I do that and how do I put it together? Mm -hmm. um, so you, you definitely see an, an increase in the number of staff doing trainings, not only to our staff, but also in the inclusion of our site leaders. So our site leaders have been super integral and involved in the workshops that they're providing. Um, we just had this past one with our middle school principals at one of the meetings to really explore the depth of their understanding and knowledge about the impacts that this will have for our kids. So these are, and I think the gear up is specifically right now looking at the middle schools, not well, they, they might work with the high schools, but they're just specifically working with the middle schools. It's a, a seven-year cohort, so they are committed to both our middle school and our high school students. Okay. They move have high school resources team. to make sure that they go all the way through college. Well, so so they're working with the middle school students and moving them into the high school, hopefully, right? And helping them go through that process as well, right? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, do I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. Yeah. Can I have a vote? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> All those opposed? 7-0. Thank you. Okay. Okay, 9.4. CCAP Agreement Educational Programs and Courses. And this is going to be presented by you, Dr. Rodriguez. Okay. Um, so as we've been mentioning before, our goal, one of our goals for our CTE Pathways is that during that third year, so the third course, that it ends in one of three ways, right? So we want it either to end in internship certifications or we want it to end in dual enrollment. So this, you will see, is the first step um, towards making that a reality. Um, so Cabrillo College um, worked with us as one of the first school districts in the county in order to develop this MOU. It also is based off of AB 288, so it's a statewide effort to make this happen. But what basically happens is children within high school have the ability to take a college-level course that they get college-level credit for that then can be transferred once they graduate from high school. So they can come into college with already having credits on the books. Um, in this case, there's two different courses that you'll see. One is MA70, which is a health careers and medical technology course um, that is going to be um, supporting about a total of 340 students in that pathway. And then the second one is DM4, and that is a digital graphic um, design pathway. We purposely wanted to make sure that, um, that there was parity. So you may remember before when I talked about articulation courses that there wasn't parity, meaning that each high school had a different um, criteria for completion. This ensures that we not only have parity across the three, but we also have one that is based out of the north zone and one that is based out of the south. Um, all
all, both courses are available to all students, but we felt it was very important that the physical location, uh, that there was one in each location, just to ensure our dedication that um, all of our students have access to dual enrollment courses. This will, of course, grow over time. Part of these MOUs requires that we specifically state not only what courses they are, um, but also the locations and how many possible students. And so this will is the first two courses. We will bring additional courses forward um, as we move forward and they do additional dual enrollment. event. 
um, because at this current point we have not made sufficient contributions. What we do feel, and it was mentioned the last time, what we do feel is that with this event that there will be more publicity and support for for it. Um, when we brought it to the foundation and specifically um, with the support of um, the the certificated um, teacher that was on that is now on our board. Um, she felt, and the rest of the board felt, that a monetary award would support people um, with really thinking that the Innovator of the Year Award was a good um, contribution. And so what we had said as a group was that what would be the max that we would want to put district funding for. And um, so we came up with 250 would be that, that max. Um, so although it is a contribution from the district of $2,000, we feel that it's a, it's a good contribution and will eventually bring in much more. Um, hopefully the foundation will be self-sustaining um, in the near future, but we feel it needs to have an impact in order to draw significant um, employee and um, community support. I, I, for me, I mean, I was a sitting governing board member when we, we adopted this and approved it. That was not the intent of it and my understanding at that time, and I voted yes to support, you know, approving the foundation. So I feel this is completely derailed from that and blindsiding to me as a sitting trustee who voted to approve it I'm with the understanding that that foundation would be fully self-supporting. It's clearly not. I, I do hear what you're saying. It's kind of like to try to kick it off and hope that it's successful, but it, it's like any business venture. If it can't be successful on its own, then maybe it's not meant to be, and as sad as that is to hear. And that's just the reality of the real world. So I will be voting no against this tonight because this is not, in my understanding of what I voted yes for with the previous governing board um, to support the foundation. That was, for all intent and purpose, was to be completely self funding, not reliant upon this district. Okay, so we have a motion. Oh, I, I, I just um, want to say that you can't support a nonprofit foundation with no staff. There, we don't have any staff in the foundation to write grants, to bring in the money, to do the marketing, to do everything that it takes to make it sustainable. So I would like to ask us to bring this back as maybe an item that we can discuss with a plan about how we are going to make it self-sustaining. I think the district will have to make initial um, financial um, investment potentially even in a 0.5 position grant writer to start bringing in the dollars that we know are out there to support these very deserving students in our district. So I'd like to see us actually as a district fund a staff person so that we can get this thing off the ground. The other thing that would really help is if the, if the board members that are sitting up here have not made, um, <coughs> have not made um, an appointment to the board, I think you should all look at that very closely. So every one of you should be have, have appointed somebody to the board, and if you haven't done that yet. Or beyond it, there's room for two more board members. Um, if, they feel, if they feel that they could, as you said. True, yes, and Maria's on. on. There's, there's no, room for two. There are room for two, but really what we really need are people who are movers and shakers who can bring in the philanthropy. So like in my case, I wanted to be on the board because I am a grant writer, but I chose somebody else who works at Granite Rock very high up so that he could bring some money and some good big ideas. So I sort of self-sacrificed myself to put somebody else on the board that I felt would be more beneficial than myself. So I wish that other people could do that too, but we really need to look at um, to, to building it. It's gonna take some investment and to support our district um, investing in it. So that's what I have to say. So with that, if there's no other comments, I will make a motion to support this tonight. I, I would actually just like to piggyback on um, Trustee DeSerpa's comments. Um, some of her points I really, really agree with, and it would be nice to see this continue to exist, to exist in what I believe how it was presented to the previous seven-member governing body. 
um, which more of us are still sitting here, that it was going to be completely self-sustaining. I understand the difficulties of a nonprofit getting it up and running, especially non-staff. But I also think a perceived perception by some of us, and particularly me, and, and, and maybe you other three did not have this, was that it was going to be those board members and on the foundation that were going to help raise these funds and, and get it up and self-sustaining and self-running. And it's just, if it's not there, then why are we doing this right now? Why not wait till it is there where it could be self-sustaining, one, and two, if, if it's, I agree with Trustee DeServa, we need to bring this back to this board because if it can't get moved into the direction to be completely self-sustaining, as hard as it is, and it may sound harsh, we need to consider the options of dispensing with it because it's not something else that the district needs to take on as another responsibility and liability. Mm -hmm. And I'll still continue to hold my position on voting no on it tonight with agreement to some of your points, Trustee DeServa. to um, just keep in mind that this is a fairly new nonprofit and it was bought in just last year and we've never really had a full board, right? And partially was because one board members had not designated um, a member to serve on that board. So obviously a two board, three board member body and not do all the work, right? So the first year was dedicated solely to getting our bylaws updated, right? Um, and having at least the three board members that we needed to actually call it a nonprofit and actual foundation. So I think uh, it's, you know, I hear what you're saying. I think it does need to be self-sustained. Uh, but at the same time, I think, you know, it comes to this board. If we're really committed to making this work, um, then we gotta make sure that we have the correct people on that board and not wait a year, two years, 12 point somewhat into those positions. And so with that, I would like to, is there a motion? I would like to second that motion and move in this forward. And I would just like to further reiterate back on that. That's why I'm suggesting maybe now this year, because you did comment on it, it is new, so maybe now is not the time to be doing this. Just food for thought. You're all going to vote how you're going to vote. I mean, I know what how this was presented to me as a sitting governing board member, and this is not what it was, so I'm not okay with it. And that will be my last say on that. Thanks. I just wanted to add, I just wanted to add to that if maybe us new board members who haven't appointed someone to take our place at the next meeting can have an appointee ready um, to bring to the board's attention or let them know if we want to sit on the foundation ourselves. I mean, I just haven't found that many. Uh, I'm, I'm going to support this, but I think we should listen to Ms. Trustee Acosta's words and take a look at this again and look a bit closer and move on. Okay, all those in favor of this Talking about our it's not here, our city council means they have here right now. Our summer in the city internship program, and this is going to be presented by Carol Ortiz, director of extended learning. Good evening, President Oswaldson, Dr. Rodriguez, and members of the board. This MOU coming before you is just an extension of the um, one we did last year that you all approved. And when we established our pilot um, internship program with the city of Watsonville, we had our first team meeting with the city actually earlier today. The two teachers who taught the program last year are very excited and are coming back and have great ideas of, of improving on the program this year and getting our students excited and ready to go. I would like to also let you know that the last day of the program, which is July 5th, is the graduation and the student presentations, and I hope you're all able to attend as well. Would you like to? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, are there any more discussion about this? This is a great program and I'll be supporting it fully, so I'll make a motion to approve it. 
So there's going to be, is there 21 students that are going to come to the program? Yes. Actually, I'm glad you asked that. Today there was uh, one student that the, te the teachers were very hesitant to let go of all the applications they've received, the great applications, so we were able to squeeze in one more, so it's actually going to be 22. Great. Okay, we have a motion. And we have a second too, right? Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye, and it's 16 away. He's not here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a great program. <clears throat> okay, 9.7. And this is the approve the memorandum of understanding between Pacific Oaks College and Potter Valley and Fed School District with Chona Keating. Dr. Chona. <laughs> and Miss Allison is our. Um, thank, thank you, Allison. President Osmondson, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. I told her not to wear the high heels. Um, this action item, along with item 9.8, is part of a growing number of multiple annual contracts um, and uh, memorandum of understandings with colleges and universities that include Cal State University, which we already have, as well as the University of California campuses. Nationwide, teacher recruitment continues to be a challenge for um, many school districts. And thanks to our board and our superintendent of your support for previous action items for mentoring um, and continuing collaboration with PDFT and TP and the colleges, we are building a much more robust mentor program so our interns can continue to thrive and grow. Um, interns are partnered with our seasoned teachers within the district who provide guidance on district initiatives, instructional practices, um, as well as, as the interns can improve their educational practice and fall in love with the communities and the students that we serve. Um, they become more reliable and motivated source for new hires to fill our vacancies. This particular memorandum of understanding is with Pacific Oaks College, a nonprofit institution located in Pasadena, California, will form a partnership in providing and coordinating services as part of the college intern program serving multiple subject and mild moderate special education interns. Okay. Any public speakers obviously? No. And um, any discussion for the board? No, I mean it's <laughs> so can I have a motion? I'll make a motion, but I um well, I'll have a second first. Yeah. No questions. Okay. Um, how much does this cost our district for every employee who goes into the garage per employee? Um, when, when we um, hire the interns, they're hired as uh, teachers because they, they, there's a way of credentials, so we pay for the interns, and that, um, that uh, credential is, that credential waiver um, meets the requirements of the Every uh, Student Succeeds Act for uh, you know, to be able to teach in a classroom. But are we getting, they're not reimbursing us for they, the cost, are they? Um, the universities um, have liability insurance, plus they also give a stipend to the master teachers that comes out of the university. But are we, pay, are we paying Pacific? Oh, what is it called? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, it's just kind of, it's a memorandum that's basically saying that we're going to support the teachers in the classroom to kind of fulfill oh. their requirements. So it's an understanding between the two parties that they're going to release and provide internship credentials, and then we in turn will support them in the classroom, make sure they have a master teacher and kind of fulfill that obligation and making sure that they're... So they're paying their tuition. This is not the program where we are just bringing like, people up and paying no, tuition. Just okay. allowing us to be able to have higher interns from their program. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Did I have a motion and a second yet? Yeah. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And the... Next one, 9.8, is by Dr. Chona Killeen. And also, this one is with Brand, Brand Mudd University. And yes. Thank you, um, President Osmondson, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. This action item um, is with Brand Mudd University, a similar internship program as 9.7. And this is, this is in regard to just psychology, though, right? Yes. So the Memorandum of Understanding um, with Brandman will form a partnership in providing supervised teacher um, field education work and school psychology 
with a student population that is diverse in ethnicity, cultural language, and social economics and special needs. for this funding round 
uh, previous uh, government, uh, Governor Brown and Newsom through the transition, his funding was available for districts who wanted to expand or implement brand new full day K. And what the, um, the state of California realized is that they had a tremendous amount of uh, districts that applied to enhance or expand and or to modernize uh, current classroom facilities. And the spirit and the intent of the original funding was to start brand new uh, for districts like PBOSD. So we currently do not have full day K. Uh, this will allow us to potentially go after uh, and uh, funding to implement facilities throughout our district. We have in the process right now, once the board approves this resolution, we will prioritize our elementary school sites uh, because once I, uh, as I mentioned, it's a competitive process and we're trying to get as much funding as we can. Uh, but we want to, for example, out of the, say 20 sites, we want to make sure at least the top five get funding. But we got to prioritize that list and work with the state. Uh, but this resolution allows us to apply for the grant. Okay, no decision for the board, correct? <laughs> yeah, I'm, missing move, move for the I'm missing full support of it, so I've been pushing that for a while. This is not no, nice to see others actually funding that we can go after to implement uh, full day care. Okay, is that a motion? <laughs> yes, that is a motion. Second, right? Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. All those opposed? Seven zero. Okay, um, 10.1, Joint Facility Use Initiative, and this is by Joe Dominguez. Two, procedures on facility use for, for our district properties. So as requested by the board, um, this evening a short presentation on how we uh, provide our, an update on our facility joint use agreements, and then also how nonprofits or community-based organizations, uh, sports leagues, get access to our facilities. So uh, our, here you have what is what are facility joint use agreements, and um, it's basically where districts or government entities like city uh, entities and other agencies uh, lack resources to provide their facilities after after school hours. For in, in case in our example, uh, some of those concerns uh, range from vandalism, the cost to operate after school hours or on the weekends, um, both for labor and then also liability issues, uh, damage to the property or um, injuries during sporting events or uh, community events. Uh, joint use agreements are also called uh, shared use or community use agreements. Uh, so that term is uh, used throughout the state of California. Uh, what this does allow though, it allows for government entities and nonprofits and other agencies to partner up and share resources. So a joint facility use agreement allows us to come together as various entities and see how we can work together to provide the resources not only for our students, but for our community um, after hours or on the weekends. So for us, we've been successful with Aptos Little League at Aptos Junior, and there you have when they came to the board previously and gave us recognition and, uh, and the award for the agreement, and then providing the um, the team there at Aptos Junior, and they won the California District 39 uh, champions. Um, that agreement, or, or a sample, is that they provide an updated scoreboard, the maintenance of the sports fields, the baseball uh, fields, and uh, install the water fountain, and are enhancing the sh uh, snack shack and restroom facility. Uh, we're also in, in discussion with PD Sports Foundation at Freedom. That's a similar agreement that's kind of being molded after uh, Aptos Little League, where they're gonna make some capital outlay contributions to Freedom School. Um, their negotiations are still pending, and we're just in discussion phase right now, but it does seem promising. Uh, one of the items that they're willing to do is re-establish the whole field, uh, provide three, three uh, middle of the high school um, soccer fields and one uh, PV soccer uh, field. Um, so that's another example. And they're also talking about sport lighting and then also looking at restroom facilities uh, and also set, uh, fencing to separate the fields from the campus. Uh, so that's another option. And then another one is the YMCA. We are currently in discussion and this one uh, sparked from the uh, San Francisco 49ers and the NFL and we have to have a partner and when we're developing sports fields, 
And so YMCA is a good partner because they have those types of programs throughout our community. And so um, we're in discussion as we speak um, uh, and also researching other opportunities. So uh, first and foremost, we have a positive working relationship with the uh, City of Watsonville Parks and Rec. And I have been meeting with the Parks and Rec Director, uh, Nick, for several months now. And uh, we brainstormed and, and looked at all our resources throughout the district. And uh, we completed, uh, uh, let's say, over 20, 25 site visits. And out of those site visits, we came to about five school sites that would be in alignment um, with the city with their uh, parks and recreation uh, master plan throughout the community. And so I'm gonna go through those real quickly. But Ann Soldo uh, was one of them. And uh, we have the pros and the cons of the site. And as you can see, um, it's good site control, there's irrigation. We have a current existing joint use agreement that's expiring, but we need to reestablish it. Some of the concerns or items we need to work on is the field needs to be leveled. Uh, Made to bring additional restrooms is also a concern, and we have gophers, and you'll see gophers throughout our on the slides. Um, but this one is very promising. We're actually wrapping this one up, and we're making sure that it's a win-win. Whereas the city parks and rec has access, they run it as a park, but they also maintain the um, field. They cut the grass, um, the maintenance, and the upkeep, and so it kind of relieves and helps our general fund. But at the same time, it also is a resource to the community. And that's kind of the spirit of all of them. EA Hall, uh, we looked at uh, as a benefit for soccer league and little league. And those are the positives. And then once again, the field needs to be re-leveled. And then another, we're working on cost estimates right now to update the fields as a whole. There's a potential for a concession stand. And we're also looking at that as well. Uh, one of the items that came up here was they have two gymnasiums. But we need to make sure access points to the campus. So that was one of the concerns as well. Another one was Cesar Chavez, uh, great for gymnasium, indoor sports, uh, central location, and it does align perfectly with their parks and rec uh, plan. Um, so they were really excited about this one. Um, one of the things is uh, poor site control or access points, and so we're going to work on that of how can we limit, if we do open it up to the community and adults, how do we limit the access and uh, control of the site. And one of the other items that we did mention, similar to Watsonville High School softball field, is uh, we're going to need netting or additional fencing at a higher level um, because some of the balls will go over into the parking lot or into the street. And so that was a concern that we had for Cesar Chavez. Uh, Cesar Chavez or Watsonville? Uh, Cesar Chavez. Oh, Cesar Chavez. Um, Starlight, uh, here is the pros and cons for Starlight. Uh, they're actually looking at this one for it to have as a park space. Um, so we're also looking researching that. And there is some joint um, park grants um, that we're kind of reviewing right now. So what would it look like if we uh, after school hours and on the weekends open it up as a park? Um, so those are just uh, preliminary discussions. AJ High uh, was another one that they uh, uh, really liked as far as the space that was out there. This one has a lot of potential. The only challenge, and we're getting cost estimates right now, there's no irrigation on the large fields at all. Um, I was kind of surprised about that, but also um, I understand now why it's in the condition that it is. Um, so we're getting those cost estimates right now. And it also, the conversation also has to start like, who's making that investment in putting in new irrig irrigation to the field? Is that 50-50? Is it the city? Is it the district, et cetera? So those are items that we're researching, but I just wanted to share the top five. Um, in the facility use permit process, and I know this was brought up, um, and we had some of the soccer leagues here, but they, they met uh, to family commitments. But we, I did meet with the two uh, soccer leagues that came previous to the board, and one of them did acquire liability insurance, and they're following this process. And so for, um, we have an online process which we go to our uh, facilities um, uh, use uh, webpage, and then it outlines uh, the process. So for Boy Scout soccer leagues, uh, they need to provide a certificate of liability of insurance and, um, and then a whole harmless identification agreement. And that's very uh, critical for the district because if there is a severe sports injury or severe uh, injury or incident of the event, and it could be, um, it doesn't just have to be a sports event, it could be a community event. And if anything happens or anyone's injured, we could be held liable. 
And so this protects the district, but also allows uh, best of our ability to open up our facility to the community or nonprofits, but there's some items that they have to have coverage for. And um, one of the other items that I wanted to mention was uh, we updated from the previous uh, board presentation from the beginning of last year is the group classification and the facility use fees. And they're broken in three categories, class one, class two, and class three. Class one is your PTA, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, um, and a majority of the students are our students and, and recreation and educational purposes. The organizations need to provide a copy of their IRS exemption status letter, making sure that they are a nonprofit, uh, 501 something. And then class two is for organizations that have a fee that's charged. Um, it's either a community-wide or, or memberships are sold, and they use it as a fundraiser, and or um, there's a profit within the uh, group or event. And then class three is for commercial and profit-making organizations. So uh, traveling road shows, car shows, um, the different uh, sports uh, leagues that are actually tournament style, this would, that's where it would fall, where there's actually a competitive and profit. And if we can click on that link, please. So here you have the facilities booking page. And from my meetings with the soccer league representatives, the first thing I noticed that this is all in English. And so I had to make it user friendly. And so now, we click on there, we have it in Spanish. And so we're working uh, with that and making sure that it's easy to use and accessible and easy to understand for all our, our parents and community members. And so we're definitely uh, moving forward on that. If we can go back to the PowerPoint. And um, I'm just going to be real brief here, but you log on, you register, you log in, you provide yourself, you input your email, and you develop your own password. You have your own account number, and as you go through this, you're registered in the system, and this is all online. And then we also have staff at our maintenance uh, department that also assist nonprofits and community groups fill this out because it is a um, some are intimidated by the online process, but we have staff to help out. And then you submit the request, the request, you have a normal schedule, a reoccurring schedule, and a regular schedule. And this is all online, and you have the ability to have either, if it's a single day, single event, and then it's marked, it's submitted to the school site, so then the school site principal reviews their school um, calendar and making sure it doesn't conflict with after school program or any other school event. A reoccurring is either daily, weekly, monthly. And then a regular, irregular schedule is multiple dates but doesn't reoccur. And this goes for not only just sports fields but also classroom space, cafeteria, um, and other items like that or facilities throughout our district. Uh, once they do that, we have the ability to have a master calendar in our system. And we get to see, um, this is a sample, this is not a real uh, calendar, but here you have the after school care and then you have Zumba classes on Thursdays, every Thursday. Um, and so that outlines that there, and the organization, organization can see this, and so they have access to that. And they also have access to see when it's approved or disapproved or declined. Uh, moving forward, uh, finalized facility joint use agreements, uh, City of Watsonville Parks and Rec, um, the PD Sports Foundation, uh, and, the, and YMCA, and then complete the cost estimates for Ansel, though I think the Ansel one will be the, the one we'll bring uh, soon to the board. Well, we're in the process of wrapping that up, as I mentioned. Um, continue to enhance the School Dude online portal, which, which is the software that we're using on the facility use permit. Uh, we have a transition meeting with the School Dude representative scheduled. Uh, review the work order system on sports facilities, playgrounds, and playfield maintenance. What I heard from Little League, both Aptos, Watsonville, and our soccer league, um, is we definitely have a lot of gopher holes and um, some unlevel um, playing fields, so making sure that those work orders are submitted and we get those completed. And then um, complete this translation of the facility use permit documents, which we have completed, and we just need to make those accessible. And then uh, continue developing community partnerships. So right now we're working, uh, one of the, well, the Golden State Warriors has a, a grant or an opportunity for refurbishing uh, interior gym space. 
And then the Santa Cruz Warriors also has uh, community grants as well. So we're looking at that. The NFL, uh, San Francisco 49ers has a grant out there right now for football field or sports field usage, preferably football. But we'd like to see if we can get that a multi-use, so we're also looking at that. And then the Watsonville Rotary, um, I'm a member of the Watsonville Rotary, and we are um, in conversations right now what would it look like to adopt a field, and so we're working on that as well. And overall review MOUs and facility agreements, and uh, making sure we provide the space uh, to build champions, and that's 2017 Watsonville Wildcats. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, question, what is the lead time um, frame for principals to review requests that get submitted through the online portal? We try to give the, the sites at least two week notice um, so that they have that in advance. Okay. And then my other question, um, have you tried contacting the San Jose Earthquakes also? for the soccer program. Um, they have worked before in the past with the Sheriff's um, Activities League, and I know the Sheriff's Activities League no longer does the summer program. So has anyone reached out to them? We will. Um, one of the, the items of the community partnerships is grown, so um, that was one that we're also looking to. Okay. And then the Sharks is another one. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Um, also, concern brought forward last time was these um, the teams using facilities, but then leaving a lot of trash and things behind, um, including groups um, like the Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts or Bible, other Bible ones that want to use property. Do we have a plan in place where they need to leave the field as they found it? Yes, yeah, so if you can go back to our facilities booking page. But on the facilities booking page on our website, we have our rules and regulations when the agencies uh, use our fields. And if we can go to the English one. Yeah. And we have um, the rules, regulations, and fee policy on our, our website and on the top of the page in blue. And so we have that available. And so it also has the, the fees associated uh, for the facility, but then the restrictions on no alcohol, no tobacco, no smoking, da 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 da. And then if the facility is damaged or you leave garbage behind, you're held accountable for that. Okay. And you may lose your permit for the next event. Okay, and this may sound like a silly question, but how do you plan on dealing with the gophers? Versus, are you thinking of trying to poison them? Are you trying to think of importing some gopher snakes? But I know the issue with poisoning them, it endangers other wildlife, um, such as our birds of prey, which is a big concern for the area that we live in. So right now we're doing an assessment, uh, right now of what fields are uh, in the condition they're in. And then I will give you an update as we find out, but I will make sure to provide an update on the next steps. Thank you. Sooner than later, what about the other four schools? I mean, are we talking 
six months, a year, 18 months? Like what kind of time frame are you thinking in reality, given the schools and what you know? I think and with, uh, with the city. With Ansel, though, we're probably within the next 30 days, uh, we'll wrap that up. Um, we're just going through some finer details. Um, the other sites, we still need a little bit of work on the cost estimates, and um, the city's also requesting like the condition of the field, so who's gonna get it into the condition needs to be into play or use, and so that's the, the conversation uh, where we're at. So we're trying to get the number where, where we need to meet at, um, and once again, it'd be similar um, frame as Aptos Little League, whereas uh, the facility fee would be waived because they're also making an investment, so we also need a uh, cost estimate that out as well. So I, I would probably need, um, I would say within just I would say six months uh, approximately, um, because each one has it's, its own little dynamic, but I would say six months and then making sure that it aligns with their park master plan, but uh, they selected the sites and now we're in conversation of, of what does that look like. So. Will you be bringing those back to the board one by one for an, an official sort of approval, if you will? Yes, so we'll, we'll bring them back one by one. One by one, okay. And then the um, last, the um, booking portal. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's being managed by each school site independently? not by the DO because I could just see, I mean, I understand that the school sites probably have first knowledge of what's going on there, but I also think that information should be communicated up to the district office level. I just see that we do have a PIO, and I would think the nature of part of the scope of her job would be to manage our public outreach, and this is really, a public outreach and it seems like if it was housed just at one ultimate place versus all these different school sites i think there may be less potential for a breakdown you know that, that those school sites should be communicating to our pios what's going on when they're not available what their schedules are and then having that house through her and then lastly that it's an equitable situation that it's like we're not just doing things in the schools in the city of Watsonville in the south zone, but the schools in Aptos that are already getting use of fields, or schools, or, you know, community use in Watsonville is not happening. That everybody's having to go through the same process. We, so we don't have one process for the north zone and another process for the south zone because that's, I mean, our superintendent constantly preaches equity, so I don't think she would agree with that. So, yes, you're correct. This is equity. Uh, this system is for north, central, south. It's all throughout the whole district. And then this is currently housed in our maintenance department um, because we also have to assign either custodial services and or maintenance workers um, because within um, the gates, core gymnasiums need to be opened up, closed, etc., and or the cleaning of those. Uh, it depends on the fee structure but that's also how the maintenance. But we're also looking at a uh, code um, oversight um, within the district office. But right now it's in maintenance. Um, so it's not at each school site? No, it's at okay. the maintenance. Because that would uh, seem like chaos. Correct. It's at the maintenance uh, okay. department. And then it's like the work order. Um, that's the easiest way to compare it. But then the site has to approve the permit. Sure. OK. Thank you. You're and welcome. thank you again for your work on this you. presentation. We're we'll right back to you. PV Sports Foundation. Yes. What uh, I know that a big part of that initiative, or who's behind that initiative, is PV United. Do we know what percentage of our students they actually serve? Good question. So that's actually in our last meeting. I requested their rosters, and then how many out of their. Uh, students or uh, players on their um, league are our students. And so that's something I requested in our last meeting. So they're actually working on getting that for me. Good, and the reason why I asked that question is because if the end goal of building these partnerships and bringing them in into uh, Freedom Elementary School is to expand access 
to a well-maintained field for our students, I want to make sure they're given priority, right? Another concern that I have is ensuring that, again, our students are given priority when it comes to scheduling. Because I know that they manage uh, several leagues, and I, I just want to make sure that they don't have control of the schedule. But the district level does. Correct. So um, that's one good point that uh, uh, going back to the win-win is making sure that our joint facility use agreements have district as priority, the school site and then the district. Um, and that's similar to the Aptos Level League is that we have priority in Aptos Junior. And for example, say there's another baseball team that we have at another campus that wants to use that, then they get the priority. So it'll be a similar set of structure. That's what I'm hoping for. Um, because I know that they're, they're willing to invest a lot of money on that field, but really what's a cap about, right? What are they asking for? So when they were moving in that direction of formalizing an agreement, I just want to make sure that it's clear uh, that we won't be given preference to one league over the other. It's first our students and then everything else after that. Correct. Thank you. <coughs> Any more questions from the board? Okay, all those, uh, we have a motion. <laughs> it's a discussion. Oh, it's a motion, it's a presentation, yeah, okay. Um, unfortunately, we have to extend our meeting because there's been a lot of questions and things we've discussed, so we have to extend our meeting. Um, I'm, 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 I'm make, I, I think we should maybe extend our meeting until 11. I think we can get it done by then. Yeah. So I make a motion to extend the meeting to 11.30. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. Okay, the last is 4.2. Ten point two, our citizen bond oversight committee by Bill Beecher, who's the president. The chair. Of the the chair. Um, I've been involved in Measure L for since twenty ten, and so I've got a lot of history. I thought it was important that with such a new board and a very strong prospect that we're going to have to go do another measure that there are lessons to be learned. And I use a process similar to what Trustee uh, Acosta uses. Mine is, you know, what went well, what didn't go well, what did you learn from it, what do you do different the next time? <clears throat> Rather than do it simplistically, I've inculcated that into this presentation. So for contents, we're going to take a look at the independent audit report. You'd already seen this in January when Joe presented it. Uh, we're going to look at the measure all the lessons learned uh, and it breaks down into demographics, training, critical projects, and what the COC did not. This came out in the grand jury discussion two years ago. And then a thing called augmentation, uh, which I think is a wonderful thing that the district did and something needs to be said about that. So the independent auditor's report uh, as you know, it's been in the board in January. Big thumbs up. Uh, this makes several years in a row where it, it's just gone really clean. It says a lot about uh, the finance department uh, and how well they have done to track everything. It also says that we've been spending our money correctly. On demographics, uh, this, this was an interesting thing that uh, until I ran for the board, um, I didn't realize that we screwed up when we did measure it out. Is that there was a major effort done in the South Zone to get voters out. And PD High, uh, the athletic team, terrific job on home banks. Uh, there was a minor effort in Aptos. Uh, we, we didn't get a lot of people out to help us with the banks. Now, the demographics are that 
people in the north zone or the Aptos area vote. And so over 83% of the people vote. In the Wasserville area, less than 40% of the people vote. So if we want after another measure, we ought to work like hell in the Aptos area because that's where your voters are. And we didn't do that. So we were lucky, we were fortunate that it did pass. So in the training area, this is something where I think we really fell down. Uh, we did good training for the administration and the COC. However, we did very poor training for the school sites, the principals, and site councils. This slowed down our ability to implement the programs because the concept that was put in place was that the individual sites, site council and the principal, would come up with their list of the projects and prioritization. Truthfully, they had no concept about what prioritization was. Because when I sat with some of them, they just wanted it all. Not realizing that we may run out of money because there's a certain amount of money allocated for each of the schools. <clears throat> and when you don't have enough money, you got to cut stuff. And then you get into those squabbles. And uh, so there was a lack of training. Now I'm going to address some of this at the end, but Joe also has some things he will do in his presentation to look at what are we going to do going forward? What are we going to do? What are we going to do different? So, as I said, this caused delays in getting projects started. And uh, it, there was a lot of grinding. So what should it have, what could it have been uh, by learning from this? And one, you train principals and site councils on the process, setting priorities. I was shocked that most people didn't understand about setting priorities. You can't just have everything. And then a uh, real major thing, we ran into, Victor and I ran into this over and over again, changing priorities. When we change principles, when we change site councils, they all had their own idea of what the priority should be, and so they would change them, and that meant we had to put a stop on programs that might have already been started to push something ahead of something else. And they didn't understand that impact of making changes. So, uh, we need to train the principals and site councils as they change over time. And I know at Mar Vista, where I spent, spent a lot of time in the last eight years, we've had four principals, each with their own idea of what should be done. And uh, it created a lot of confusion, a lot of frustration for uh, Victor and the facilities guys. So critical projects, um, this came up after the fact. This was not built into the original process. Uh, this is something that we brought to the board uh, a year ago. Uh, that Victor and I changed uh, and added into the process that critical projects such as replacing roofs or mandated changes were initially left to the site councils. That had to go, and so we replaced it with a new procedure. They don't get to vote. It has to be done, it has to be done. So, what the COC is not, uh, there were suggestions in the grand jury report that the COC should have been a proactive committee second guessing the plan. Well, if you look at the state law on defining what our role was, that's not in there. It's really a passive role that we look and we're just a judge to make sure that the monies are being spent properly. Now, augmentation is something that the district has done. We ran out of money. Uh, labor and material about 35%. So in some cases, we didn't have enough money to finish some of these projects. So they augmented the funds, the Measure L funds, with other funds, uh, whether it was Measure 39 or other areas, in order to make sure it got it done. And I think, you know, that's a big time thing that uh, the district did, and uh, kudos for having done that. So, uh, questions on my part, and then we'll let Joe talk to you about 
stuff we're going to do in the future, along with we've got projects coming up for the summer. Yes, you have questions? Nobody do have questions? This is the one time I get to ask you for questions, right? Mm -hmm. What do you see as next steps? Well, Joe's going to address, because I brought up some concerns and things that I have seen, and we discussed that, and so I think we have some <coughs> good approaches for doing that. Yes. So I have to disagree with you a little bit about the whole Aptos piece because there was a tremendous effort to get out the vote in Aptos on Measure L, and in fact, it won overwhelmingly. So I, you know, multiple nights every week was talking to citizen groups, including Aptos okay. Soccer Club, who sent out an email to all 6,000 email addresses, you know. Well, I was at Aptos Little League, I was at Rotary, I mean, I was everywhere talking about Measure L with, with our, staff. Yeah, so, my comments are really more about uh, Jeff's side of the fence, uh, the west side of the highway. We had three teachers, one principal, myself. My wife voted against Measure L because she said, if the teachers don't care, why should I vote for it? Yeah. That was a... Yeah, so you know who really helped a lot was the PB High kids getting out the vote in terms yeah. of doing the canvassing, and so to them we are indebted, really. And but there's something to be learned on how they did that and what they did is why couldn't we have done that better, you know, like Great LR, no turnout. Yeah. So that's where the votes are and that's where the money is, too, in the district. How many um, members are on the COC right now? Seven. And do you need more membership? It would the, be nice. the group was bigger, correct? Yeah. Okay, and how do we appoint people? Does the board do that, or the district has to do that? Or? Well, the, the chief business officer that has, in the past, been the one that's gone out and helped look for people. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's winding down, so it's hard to find people to come in. Uh, I mean, I've sat as the chair, and truthfully, I'm only supposed to sit for one or two years. Nobody wants it. <laughs> yeah. So I'm dead. And fortunately, because I feel like I've got an invested part of this thing, uh, I don't mind. And just for the public's sake, how, do we have any more bonds to sell, or are they all exhausted? Uh, so they're all exhausted, and we took down the third issue. We took down. So. Um, <coughs> the district did that approximately two years ago? Yeah, I came before. Yeah, oh yeah, but for the public's sake, since we're on the topic. And so I heard you say that the money is gone. And that's, is that true? It's not all spent. It's not all spent, right? Because we still have like the bucket for Power Valley High School, right. et cetera, and all the other aptos and all the other projects moving forward. Yeah. Okay. So we drew down the third issuance. The third issuance is allocated. Uh, so in so there is no fourth issuance, et cetera. So the money's all drawn down, and now uh, we're looking probably about four to five years to phase that money out and the various projects. Okay. And in terms of the endowment trust funds, we have like a maintenance trust fund and a technical, technic yeah, tech trust fund. And I know that those trust funds needed to be expended within, I think, a 10-year period from 2012. Is that correct? Correct. And how are we doing on those? We are doing really well. Uh, okay. There are 700,000, 500,000 annually mm -hmm. over that period of time. And so I know both um, our maintenance department and our IT department are uh, maximizing those funds. Okay, and great. We're, we're talking a little bit about that. Okay. And then are you keeping your finger, Joe, on the pulse of um, making sure that if, if we can refinance any of those bonds that we will? I know the interest rates aren't super favorable compared to what they have been in the past few years, but I hope somebody's paying attention to that. So yes, um, and that's, um, so districts are allowed to refinance as long as you do not drop them down. 
issuance. So the district already drew down the third issuance, so we don't have the ability to refinance. Oh, I didn't know that piece. Right. Okay. But Good. moving forward, but yes, and, and we're aware of that in the oversight committee. So as we move forward in a new bond measure, when that time does come, we just as uh, fiscal stewards and, and as a Board of Trustees is making sure that we maximize and when we do right refinance, that we maximize those tax dollars. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, Bill, and everybody on CSC for your service. Yeah. Mr. Beecher, I actually have a couple of questions for you. Okay. <laughs> Hello, good evening. Um, sorry, it's cold in here for you. I should have referenced your process, right? <laughs> um, I, I have sat on the Citizens Oversight Committee in our community, and I know it can be a very daunting and thankless job, and the recruitment is an extreme struggle, so with that, thank you. Um, you know, there were, one of the things that really, really caught my attention in what you were discussing, you know, there's that old saying that I know you're going to know, right? Two things in life are for certain, death and taxes. I think a third should have been added to that, change. Good, bad, and different change is inevitable, right? I mean, since this bond, our district has seen a significant administrative change. We have a different superintendent, who some could even call a change agent. She's very different from her predecessor. So, in addressing the issue of what you mentioned, because it is important to to identify what you're talking. I heard what you were saying about the change. Changes in principles, changes in those look the the school site level, right? Because kids leave schools, we get those parents leave, new kids new right. We take CEOs. So what are your thoughts or recommendations to this governing body for addressing that when change is inevitable? I think it, it's such something like this, sure. it's a long process. It, it's uh Kind of like raising your children, uh, you can be very rigid and you'll just have lots of problems. You just have to be flexible. You have to look at the situations. I mean, last year there was an example where we saw a problem with the process, so we made changes. You know, being, being open and recognizing uh, when things are working or aren't working and making the necessary changes. If you go into it thinking you've got it nailed, things Augmentation was an example where the district recognized that we were not alone. And then going out to the sites and working with the sites and help, helping train some of the new principals. We went out and we worked with Bradley and Mar Vista recently uh, last month because they wanted to change. They wanted to change the priorities and so we had some heart to heart discussions and training. Uh, yeah. Well, and, and I can recall um, when Trustee Yahira was on the board, um, and particularly actually with this school, we as board members would get complaints that nothing was happening here, but he had a, almost a constant frustration that the local site for the school was almost nothing at times, yeah. but at less than a handful of people, if you will. Well, that, that's uh, important. And had, with that trouble, you yeah. know, to create, like, okay, so what is the plan for us, EA Hall School? So, addressing that issue. And well, part of that, um, because this happened in other schools as well, I mean, gradually, just recently, at our COC meeting came in, and um, we heard the same, we haven't done anything, and Mar Vista told us about, we haven't done anything. Well, out of our $6 million, we already spent four and a half million, and we go, what do you mean we haven't spent anything? Um, Transparency uh, was an issue in the, uh, you know, four years ago. That the way we were reporting projects was very confusing. That we had ten pages of projects, but they were a jumble. And so you'd find aptos on all ten pages, and you had to hunt and peck, and it made it hard for the board, made it hard for us on the COC to follow what was being done. So. To the credit of the uh, maintenance group, is they organized so that you had the north zone by school, so you could look at a Mar Vista or an Aptos High, and you saw all the projects for that school right there. So it makes it easy for us or for uh, the 
principal or the site council to say, well, what is being done? Um, and that's an ongoing issue. How do you make sure that things are easily read? Because four years ago, it was a jungle. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of discussions with the CEO to back that we needed better transparency and he didn't want to make those changes. And under Melody, we made some changes and, uh, and then we got beaten up by the grand jury that we were being, uh, weren't being transparent after we had already made the changes, for which I wrote a very angry rebuttal to the Sentinel over the castigation that we'd gotten. Because mm -hmm. I thought it was unfair. It didn't show what progress we made. They reported on something that was true two years before. And it was fair to say we were ugly at that time, but they didn't show we'd done anything, which was unfair to the district mm -hmm. and to the COC, and especially to the facilities people who have been working their hearts out. Mm -hmm. So you gotta, you got to be aware of what's working, what's not working, back to your process or my process, and you make adjustments. Because if you stay with a rigid plan, you'll always be disappointed. You'll get beat up. Yeah, I think you have to trust it. That maybe, you know, maybe more reports, more frequent from the committee to the boards. So right. You can help, you know, just the service that you know, keep them all in that place, right? Yes so, and no, but, you know, most of the I, effort. Not that we need to control right. and micromanage and just say, well, we, we have that discussion of how often, actually, we had it earlier this year, how often do we meet and how often do we go. Well, most of the work is done in the summer. Yeah. So, in effect, the COC and you, the board, need to have an idea going into the summer of what's going on because you're going to be asked by your constituents. We get asked by your same constituents uh, because we haven't done anything. And then you need to know in, November, in September or October, well, what did you get done? You said, here's what we're going to do now. Tell us that you got it done. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the, the, I agree. There should always be the vision, the plan, the execution. The execution is fine to change as long as it's reviewed. Um, right. The what worked and the what didn't work and the why. Yeah. So, thank yeah, you. Yeah, what are you going to do different the next time? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, so a quick update um, on our uh, summer projects and how we're moving forward. So uh, for the North Zone at Plus High School, we're repairing uh, long overdue structural drive lot and roof repair in building D and E. And then um, really excited about the student quad safety and accessibility improvements. Um, it, the student quad is going to have a shade structure and really a place for students to uh, from already hang out and really be a student quad. So we're really excited about that. And then Mar Vista, phase two, uh, safety and accessibility. Uh, the parking lot, uh, a ramp, and student super service center is where we're updating that. For the central zone, you have the list here and the list varies um, from uh, outdoor multi-use pavilion at Lakeview. Calabasas, exterior painting and drive rod repair. Um, Rolling Hill Middle School is the NPR HVAC unit. Uh, so we're definitely, um, these are all moving forward for summer 19. For the south zone, you have Lytton Scott, McQuitty, Maloney, um, perimeter safety fencing, ADA accessibility for Lynn Scott, uh, Maloney, uh, front engine improvements, and it's gonna look pretty nice, and the uh, site safety. Uh, Pajaro Middle School perimeter fencing and safety improvements for the site as well, and that's in the south zone. District-wide, uh, one of the items we heard loud and clear in, in my site visits is we see throughout the district the need for whether it's carpet, tile, or vinyl, or flooring, and so these are the sites throughout the district that we will have some flooring um, repairs and inst installations throughout. And then for clock bell paging, we have some aging systems throughout the district, uh, Renaissance and Bradley. And then Bradley, um, we are currently in discussion right now uh, to, uh, to the comment about um, that Mr. Beecher mentioned, it is showing action. And so for Bradley Elementary, we've been meeting with the principal and we are actually looking at two, and I'm not, 
we're looking at it right now, whether uh, installing a track, a walking track for the kids, and or painting the school this summer. And so one of those items will be completed this summer. We're still finalizing the cost estimates with the architects, et cetera. Et cetera. Uh, these are non-bond projects. So these are other uh, projects that we take on through our facilities department and other uh, funding sources. Um, so Migrant Head Start, uh, the facility needs specific per site through our Head Start program. Prop 39 Energy Efficiency Projects, this is not Prop 39 Charter, but this is the HVAC upgrades and lighting upgrades for our, our uh, dependent charter schools. And then you have the Prop 39 at EA Hall for Navigator Charter, and that's the portable restroom, um, which uh, enables Navigator Charter to have limited access to EA Hall campus and so it separates both entities. And then the child development, the Watsonville Children's Center, uh, flooring replacement, new carpet, and tile. PV High football field and athletic field update, the demolition of the portables, and you can see the, we are working on the grading and uh, leveling the field out. And so ribbon cutting complete, and thank you and our superintendent for her leadership to making that happen. And I'd like to thank our facilities team and our, our facilities lawyers and our um, consultants to helping us hit that deadline and making it happen. So we're very excited. Um, we're moving forward. The demolition has been completed. We're working on the clearing of the grub and the grade and et cetera. And now we're working on the removal modification of the irrigation system because that all has to be reinstalled and repositioned. Um, but overall, I'm pleased to announce construction is uh, we're on the timeline and we're on schedule. And so we're really excited about that. The auditorium, um, this one is an estimated timeline. Um, I mentioned estimated because this is with the city planning department. And so these are verbal um, agreements that we've come to. Um, and we are gonna, it's a partnership where we're, I would say it's going a lot smoother than the uh, football field permitting process. And so they shortened down for example, their six-month review, uh, legal review window, they sh uh, shrunk that down to like approximately six weeks. Um, and so we have the milestones there. Uh, Jim Ford, the staff report to the planning department, to the planning commission, and I'll be in attendance there. And on the 15th, we are meeting with the architect, our leadership team of facilities, and uh, review value engineering, the scope, timeline, and the budget of the auditorium, uh, and just making sure and a uh, nice surprise for the um, champion of Swallows uh, award that I got this evening. Uh, but the other piece is the design of the auditorium to making sure that it's eco-friendly and it's easy to maintain from the exterior. So lessons learned that we learned from the other buildings that we have on that campus. And then it goes to the council and we'll come back around and uh, but we'll provide an update um, to the board as we proceed. But this is moving forward. We expect uh, in 2019 uh, for the pro uh, project to, to start. It's still to be determined on the start date because we have a process of going out to bid, et cetera. So that we just want to make sure that this is a tentative timeline that I wanted to provide just to show how we're making progress. Uh, moving forward uh, with our Citizens <coughs> Bond Oversight Committee uh, and Mr. Beecher's leadership, I'd like to thank him for his leadership. Uh, he's agreed and um, really supported in having quarterly meetings and as he mentioned we were having only uh, two meetings a year and now we change that to quarterly so that we can get in the front end and uh, to the, some of the questions that were answered to have full transparency of what's being planned prior to summer, during summer, and after summer and just uh, a pulse check on the funding. The other piece is making sure that we have our new principles, uh, new principal orientation and a training because as we have new leadership at the sites, not only do they inherit the student achievement plan and the um, academic component of it, they also inherit the business operations side of that. And so we want to make sure they're successful. The other piece is uh, to invite in, in partnership with the board is a 2019 the Summer Success Bus Tour. Uh, after we complete our projects, we're going to do, uh, have a bus tour of all the projects completed in partnership with the CBLC and the members of the community and our elected officials. One of the biggest challenges, and I think uh, Mr. Beecher uh, touched on it, 
is we need to define or develop a project master schedule with budgets, and that is something that we are working on right now. Um, in layman's terms, or how to easily explain that is, what are the projects that we're doing in 2019? What's the dollar amount over and under on the budget? 2020, 21, and 22. So it's a multi-year master schedule of projects and how they are funded. And so it's uh, really like a roadmap for facilities planning. And that's something we did not have, but we're developing now. And the other component that we're working on right now is project management uh, software. So we can link up with our financial system to making sure that we can track every dollar spent and how we are uh, funding our projects throughout. And then the other component is building our internal team, which we are working on right now uh, in staffing and recruitment of our department uh, for planning specialists, uh, senior construction manager, and uh, positions that are really needed. Thank you. Okay, public speaker. Is Stacy Anderson still here? Yes, she's still here.
we have been able to hire back that 28% of the people we cut. And so we staff up to be bigger than 28%. So, yeah, it sounds like making excuses, but that's reality. I and mean, that's what we're facing. I mean, Aptos High is a great example. We've got dry rot out there, and uh, we need money to go fix that, and that isn't covered in the measure also. So, uh, Joan, do you want to add to that? I'll, I'll just be short and brief, but we are, we have the work order system, we're reviewing it, and we are establishing our, um, and the board support to establish a deferred maintenance budget, which is a, the 3%, so we have had that established. So we met with the department and we're reviewing all the work orders and making sure that we complete the work orders and so that's currently under review. And so I'll provide an update at a later point in time. Thank you. <coughs> okay, any other questions from the board? Something else to say. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, two questions, uh, Mini White and Mia Hall. I know uh, I've been on the committees, the student parent committees for a long time, and I know recently they asked for any remaining money to be put to portables. Two, we still have a pile of dirt here at E Hall, which has been there a long time, and I would just like to follow up and see what's going on with that. All right, so definitely uh, a shift, I think. Um, I know we touched on this about how do we move forward. So one of the items that for EA Hall and MNT White, we have an allocation in the bond program. It's not enough to complete the big picture project. So for EA Hall, we don't have enough to do a football field and track, et cetera. And for MNT White, we do not have enough to <coughs> demolish all, of, all the portables and replace them with all brand new. But the direction and the board approved, I believe last month, um, to architectural firm, not the same one, um, to do a review and assessment of each campus. And the directive is, what can we get done with the money that we have? Rather than holding on and saying we don't have enough, is what can we complete with the money we have and move it forward? And so I say that, like for example, Minty White, there's 15 portables and we don't have enough money to do 15, well, can we do 10 or can we do uh, half of those? And so that's the direction now. And so that's a big shift from what it was before. And then the field, the, um, the mountain uh, or the dirt, we're looking at that right now. It is clean dirt and there is dirty dirt. But that has been tested and it is clean dirt. So we're also looking at that for PV high to be either used as backfill for the leveling of the field and or maintaining it for EA Hall field. But one way or another, we're going to make sure that, and I know it's an eyesore, so we're, gonna, we're making a movement on that. To the principals that we do the principals at Mini White Media Hall know? Currently, right now, the, the architects were just recently approved by the board, so they're barely, they did complete site visits, and they're doing very preliminary uh, reviews right now, but there will be a meeting with the principals to kind of give them the, the big picture, and then, but also, I believe both architectural firms did get input from the principals of kind of the need of the campus and how they use the campus, so that's been done, but then we're going to come back around with kind of the the preliminary drawings. Yeah. Uh, I, I know for sure that the parents in the school site council really might want all remaining money to be put to principals, I mean to portables, and I just want to relay that message. Thank you. To so your issue on EA Hall, uh, as you know, we had a roof problem leaking like crazy. That sucked up a lot of money to get it fixed. So, you know, as, as an organization, we're doing the best we can with the money that we've got, but you've got to take care of those things that are critical. Yeah. The room is critical. I, I just want to be able to go back to these parent councils and report yeah. back and let them know what's going on. Thank you. But you also had the issue of principal changing the EA call, which complicated communication. I, I just have one quick question because I get the same constant complaints that Danny does, Joe, with regards to the dirt, because of how long it has been there. It's not just, you know, we talked earlier about equity. It's not just that it's an eyesore. You have to, it brings on another perspective. It makes it look like, oh, EA Hall, 
It's a good dumping ground. Let's just dump it there and leave it there. It's been there for a long time. So could you tell us a time frame? I heard what you said could be done with it. I understand construction. I know the difference between clean dirt and not clean dirt. But when can we be able to tell people, you know, we've heard from administration, it'll be gone by X, Y, and Z. We'll We're come. sorry it's there, but it will be gone. At least, what could you tell us when we could say? Six months? A I year? Say, I would say within six months, we'll know, we'll, we'll know within, I would say, a month, the timeline, and then know when officially that dirt will be either used at PV High or we need to use, uh, relocate or use it somewhere else or work. And we're also doing a cost analysis because, uh, believe it or not, that clean dirt is expensive, but if we just uh, relocate it and get rid of it, what is the cost to do that, Heather? And then are we going to need that for EA Hall? But yes, right. so within, within the month, we're going to know the timeline for PV High and then also what that credit looks like um, because that's also a resource to that project, so we should get something in return. Yeah, because I think the community is wise on that. It's you know, good dirt, and so why the heck haven't we just donated it to get rid of it? So, I mean, you've given us at least some response to tell our constituents who are complaining, and so it'd be nice to know, hopefully within six months, it could stop being here. Um, you know, and if it's still there, then I guess Danny and I are going to ask you why in six months. Right. Hopefully it won't be. Thank you. And I do understand, and, and with the superintendent's support, we are shifting on coming through with the promises. Um, within our bond program, because we understand the importance of coming through on that and then showing our voters for a future bond that these projects have been completed. And so we are working on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, now I get to talk. <laughs> so, um, like many districts in the state of California, we face devastating budget cuts for year after year after year. And I think in my tenure, we cut about $56 million out of the budget during those years. We are right now up to, I think, and I don't know what the, what the governors may revise, maybe up to 2008 standard in terms of allocated budget for this district. Correct. So, well, well, I mean, that's not good, obviously, because of the crazy amounts of costs that we've incurred. So between health benefits and salary increases, um, that takes up a giant pieces of our budget and we're, we're still at 2008 levels. So, um, like Mr. Beecher said, we did cut a ginormous amount of staff. I think, you know, I remember Bobby Salazar telling me at one time, Aptos High had like 17 custodians, you know, and at the, at the deepest part of our budget cuts, I think he was the only one. There was him and there was a night staff and that was it to cover all that 40-acre campus or whatever it is and um, clean everything. I mean, it just, we cut as much as we could until we couldn't cut anymore. So that explains, and, and at the same time, the state cut our deferred maintenance um, money, so we weren't getting any of that. So essentially, we were left completely devastated. Um, so little by little, and that's one of the reasons I campaigned so hard for this bond is because it was the only way at that time to make any improvements in our facilities. So all of us up here are very well aware of the crumbling infrastructure that we have here in this district, because this is a very old district, and in addition, all over the state, we are very well aware. I think the governor's aware of that, and he's trying to remediate that now. Um, I think the improvements that we made are important. When we sold this bond program to every single school site, we wanted them to have buy-in because they're stakeholders and we allowed them to sort of prioritize decisions and in some cases, those decisions weren't the best for the school and we had to reprioritize them, like Mr. Beecher said, and do roofs, which are not sexy, you know, but they were absolutely needed because we have to protect our buildings. So a lot of money was reallocated to the roofs, which you know people don't see that because it's up. Um, anyway, we needed 300 to just do the bare minimums. We only got 150 going off of that bond. So um, thank you for all the work, and I know you have a, you're running a skeleton crew in your office. So I'm, I saw that Howard 
retired. Congratulations to Howard. But I, you know, I worry that that whole crew that knows what to do in facilities and maintenance is, we just don't have the depth of um, experience there. So I'm looking forward to seeing the new crew that comes in. Um, I did have a question, but I forgot it after my long lecture. Uh, you only had three questions. <laughs> so we are moving forward and we're building uh, internal capacity. Oh. We have uh, Ryan um, is one of our planning specialists that is taking the lead. Um, and then we're also maximizing other facility funding. So what we get from the state, and you're correct, there were cuts and that flexibility given to districts. But there's other, there's local funding and other facility funding that we're also trying to maximize. Sure. And then we went after the eligibility, um, so we're, we're maximizing. Well, and the other thing is when we got, when we went out for that bond, we were assured that there would be all this sort of matching dollars from the federal government that never came. So we thought we could maximize the 150 into something that was close to 300, and much of that never ever came to, to fruition. It just wasn't available at all. So that was another issue. Um, my question about EA Hall, because is, EA Hall was really a hero's big thing. Like he wanted the fields completed, correct? Correct. So you're telling me, would I just hear you say we don't have enough money to complete the fields here? Correct. There's, uh, there's not enough to complete the football field, the track, et cetera. But what we're doing now is like, what can we do? The direction of the architect is what can we get done with the money we have? Okay. And then my role is to find other funding to fill in the gap. So Wharf to Wharf has been a very generous partner with us. And so I really want us to reach out to them because I have, and if you want me to do it, I will, but they have money that they could provide for the track. Yeah. Work so to work. I appreciate that and work to work did and I should have put that on there. Um, they did reach out uh, for PV High and they also mentioned EA Hall Field. Okay. Um, so they already approached so we're the other thing, the you know, I heard you, you talk about Bradley putting in maybe a track. Well, I wrote a grant for Valencia 10 years ago and got $10,000 to put in our little track at Valencia. That came from the work to work. So they'll do elementary schools too. So I encourage you to reach out to them and I'll help if you need it. Thanks. Okay, any more questions? <laughs> okay, we're actually going to be able to finish the agenda, hopefully. I mean, the, the, 11 is the consent agenda. Okay, the speakers, are there any deferred items? Okay, can I have a motion? Second. I'd like to pull a couple. I need to pull 11.3 and 11.5. And actually 11.6 is well. Like SLB, for example, in Scotts Valley. 
because they did not do, they only did one petition and so they were able to support the matching. We couldn't, if we would have received both grants, we would only have been able to afford this grant, this level of grant, because we went, we were going for a large, um, large amount in the other grant. And there's a matching component, meaning a one-to-one. If they gave us 200,000, we had to commit 200,000 of district funding. So, it, so we, we, did, we just didn't get the grant? They did, did not, not choose us? Is that um, what there was an error in submission, um, and so it was not submitted correctly. Got it. Okay. Thank you. That explains it. No, I have 11.5 minutes. Oh, sorry. Okay, so we're voting on 11.3 motions. We just motioned to bring in our first half second. What? All the vote. We have a motion. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those books. Okay, the, you, you're doing 11.5? 11.5. Huh? Yeah. Okay, 11.5. So this is a consent for transportation plan to ensure school stability for students in foster care. So this was a confusing backup for me to understand who's paying for what. So I was wondering if somebody could speak to that. Because I get the idea and the intent. I worked in child welfare, so I totally get it. But it's just, they talk a lot in here about LEA, and so who, who is actually going to be paying for the transportation? Uh, the answer to that is it depends. So right now, basically, the MOU is, is generated based on, on student best interest. So it really is up to the LEAs to work together depending on the placement of the actual child. So if the child is moved out of our county, per se, and put into another district, it really is up to the entire uh, TDM team and those pieces that go into placement for students as well, as to whether the student will be able to still come back to the original district of origin, or whether they go to their new district placed on their, their placement. So it is kind of a team decision as to what that looks like. In terms of what it means financially for us, we've, this has been going on already within our region in terms of, you know, best interest of students and working out with each other and, and um, really figuring out where does that student necessarily belong? What are the transportation needs and occurrences? But there has been no cost impact to us either. So we have just as many kids. Because we are so large, the majority of our kids stay within our district anyways. Um, those that do go out, we've made arrangements to be able to, to take care of that and vice versa. So when we receive students from others as well, there are LEAs in the age. Are we considered an LEA? We are a local education. Oh, I thought that was like the, C the district, I mean the COE. So no, it's, it's us. It's us too. Okay. So, so child the, welfare doesn't pay for any of this transportation. It's on the I education system. I have places where that has happened. Um, so sometimes depending on the agency and what it looks like. So this is county generated as well. Uh, so as a county team, basically the rest of the districts have gotten together and said that to this point, this has been very unusual for us to be able to have a conversation back and forth as to really where the student gets the transportation funding from. Um, but I think in large part that's worked to our benefit because our kids have been able to stay within our own region because we're larger. Okay. Thank you. Okay, are you satisfied with mm -hmm. that one? Mm -hmm. Okay, do you have a motion? Have a motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any other deferred? Um, yes. So 11.66. No, that's not it. Sorry. 11.16 is what I, I meant. 11.16? Uh huh. 16. I did say 11. I meant 16. Okay. The navigator Joe was about that one. Okay. Either, I think Dr. Rodriguez will speak to this. She so when we talk too. about um, the Navigator Charter School pulling to about first year 1.5 to $2 million out of our budget, is this an addition, this, these bathrooms that we need to build out and all the other things to build out, is that an additional cost on top of the 1.5 to $2 million? Yeah. So the, yeah, so they, their total cost to us um, will be 
approximately two million this year. There will be a loss of about two million dollars plus plus all the construction. No, including the oh, including okay, great for the fall. Okay, thank you. <laughs> this is what Joe spoke to this in his presentation. This is the same thing, right? That was the connection I made. That, mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Oh, uh, Joe talked about it coming out of Measure L funds. No. No. Okay, because it was in the Measure L presentation, so that's why I got confused. Yes, that's so it was in the summer school. It was in the summer, summer project. The summer summer project. So okay. it was on the last slide that includes other funding sources. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve 11.16. Certificated personal report as presented by district administration on May 22nd, 2019, with 137 and 12 additional action items. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Motion number two, closed session item 2.3. I move to approve the classified personal report as presented by district administration on May 22nd, 2019, with 53 and 5 additional action items. Number one, the Paro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Carlos Baran as the new principal at Amesti Elementary. Carlos comes to us from Monterey Peninsula Unified School District, where he served as assistant, assistant principal at Seaside High before moving to principal. Carlos has served as the Paro served as a principal at Seaside High for the past six years. Carlos was a student of Paro Valley Unified School District and expressed desire to give back to his community and the district that served him. The Pajaro Valley Unified School District is excited to bring back one of its own to support our teachers and students. Announcement number two. The Pajaro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Jose Rocha as a new coordinator for Migrant Seasonal Head Start Disabilities Mental Health Program. Mr. Rocha possesses a number of outstanding qualifications, including a Master's in Early Childhood Education and a Bachelor's Degree in Human Development from Pacific Oaks College, an associate's degree in early childhood education from Cabrillo. He is, he is a cert certified design result develop profile trainer, pre-K pre class observer at a Britain of Portas Opening Doors Parenting Curriculum Facilitator. Mr. Rocha is currently a quality enrichment coach for Encompass Community Services, where he also served as a site supervisor, lead teacher, and head start teacher since 2005. Mr. Rocha also served as coach for First Five Santa Cruz County. With his varied experience as a coach working with preschool students, we believe that Mr. Rocha will be a great asset for Migrant Seasonal Head Start. Okay, I'll make a motion to close. I am going to close. Finally, close. Is there any no more comments? Yes. So this is this is going to be for our next. Two point seven final settlement agreement and release for one special education student the vote was seven to There you go. Thank you very much. So our next meeting is gonna be June twelfth, Wednesday at the district office boardroom this time.